Sup, my fellas, don't forget to leave feedback and enjoy the story. Errol stood in front of the other people and smiled. In front of them was a grate that glowed blue and inside was food. The residents did a great job so they don't have to worry about food anymore. A man was standing in front of the hero, holding ears of corn on his shoulder. He didn't think that they would be able to get such a good harvest in a place like this. Then, he held out his hands, which contained two different varieties of grains. The grains they gathered are twice as large as normal, all thanks to Prince Errol. The hero smiled, and in his head there was a picture of how magicians worked. Errol replied that it was all thanks to them. They worked overtime to achieve this result. The hero raised his hand to the bars. He was satisfied with the mage's work. Errol looked up and smiled. The queen's family won't bother him again, they don't care. The hero's mini empire is back on its feet. He hopes that this will continue. Fifty years ago, after the Great War, only three countries remained afloat. We are shown the coats of arms of countries, the so-called three great powers, the Arnesia Empire, the Merman Empire, and the Damanil Kingdom among them. The Damanil Kingdom had the least influence. This country was held up more by luck. We are transported to the Kingdom of Damanil, to the banquet of the Chancellor of the Kingdom. A man with a monocle was holding out a glass containing a yellow drink. He hoped everyone would enjoy tonight. A man with green hair was standing next to the Chancellor. He said they had prepared a present. It was modest, but made with great love for the Chancellor. The man waved his hand to the maid and asked her to bring it quickly and show it to him. The girl opened a box containing a jar. The Chancellor picked it up and smiled. This is a precious elixir that is only sold in the Arnesia Kingdom. If you apply it on your head, your hair will grow back. A cure for baldness. The green-haired man was hoping that the Chancellor would like it, so he asked to accept the gift. The Chancellor put a hand on the man's shoulder. Such a gift is certainly not cheap. The Chancellor asked the man what he wanted as a return gift. The green-haired guy was smiling maliciously. He replied that he did not think that the Chancellor would give something in return. But his son is being sent to war next year, the man hinted. And he's a little worried. The Chancellor closed one eye and smiled broadly. He memorized the man's words. The banquet was a success. People were chatting and drinking. Under the lamplight, a yellow drink bubbled beautifully. It tastes good. Recently, in the kingdom of Damanil, goods imported from the kingdom of Arnesia are very popular. Of course, we are talking about smuggling. In the same year, in the conference hall of the kingdom of Damanil, King Hazen Lucia Rutania was sitting on a chair, scattering papers. He asked people what it all meant. The king's subordinates sat in front of him with their eyes closed. They continued to import goods from Arnesia illegally. The king had heard that the recent banquet only served imported goods. Hez and Lucia Rutania held his face while the purple-haired man stood beside him. The king didn't understand what was going to happen next. King Damaniel's second-in-command, Duke Elgijan, has requested that his majesty calm down. The three subordinates were confused. Don't they understand what will happen if this continues? The king asked them. If nothing is done, the external debt will double or even triple. Hez and Lucia looked up sadly. The economic gap between the three countries is still small, but the scales are already tipping in a certain direction. All because some people continue to create new products. Errol was riding on a kind of swing, and there was a pile of gold under him. The king was sitting on his throne, and his face was covered in sweat. The Merman Empire has already protested against the importation of their paper due to the unusual production technology. So how does Hez and Lucia close the gap in the economy? Duke Eljajan went up to the king and said that there was no need to delay any longer. They must do something. The king rose slightly from his chair and raised his right hand. Hez and Lucia thought that their opponent was a powerful state, not easily defeated. But the duke replied that it was not necessary to fight them alone. The purple-haired man raised both hands at chest level and said that in times like these, it was worth rallying with like-minded people. The duke clasped his hands together. They need to form an alliance that will destroy the Arnesia kingdom. Thus, the kingdom of Damanil sent out proposals for an alliance to many. The duke and other cloaked figures were gathered around the table. This is a secret meeting in the dungeon of the palace of the kingdom of Damanil. The duke was standing in front of these people, and candles were burning on the table. He greeted everyone who shared their views. Grand Duke Gong, representative of the Merman Empire, and Count Marin Binstad, representative of the Sejapan Principality. They noticed that a long time has passed since the last meeting and hope that these are not just words. The leaders of their territories removed their hoods. Although the Sejapan Principality doesn't belong to the three great powers, they have a very good army. So, all the allies gathered. But one chair was empty. The Duke of the Merman Empire and the Count were looking at him. Sunkuk didn't show up. He pretends to be clean, but when he senses a prophet, he'll come running, Goon said. They're going to take the Arnesia Empire apart soon, so there's no point in hiding anything from each other. He offered to start negotiations. Goon and the gelding nodded. Elgijan raised his left hand above the table and said to stop the Arnesia Empire. Their rapidly growing economy cannot be ignored. 
Dun agreed. He added that this is one headache. The scar-faced man raised his hand and asked, Do they have a chance of defeating the Arnesia Empire? If they fail, it will be a big problem for them. Elgijan abruptly walked up to Count Gelding, who had sweat on his face. That's why they need to form an alliance, Elgijan said. No matter how strong a country is, it will be difficult for it to resist an entire alliance at once. The purple-haired man half closed his eye. In addition, if they are forced to fight a war, they will simply not have the strength to produce. Duke Elgijan recalled Errol's appearance. By the way, according to rumors, it is the younger prince who contributes to the production of new products. At the age of 8, he had already created something outstanding. And at the age of 14, he revived the land that was in decline. Although some rumors may be exaggerated. No, if you leave it like this, it will grow up and cause them even more problems. Arnesia's reign will never end. Elgijan looked down at his hand, then clenched it into a fist. They can't delay. Either they're sitting there, afraid of war, or they'll go and rip the guy's head off. Dune and the gelding sat with smiles on their faces. The Duke of the Merman Empire raised his right snarl and opened his mouth slightly, while the Count of the Sejipang Principality punched his palm. The Emperor of the Merman Power and the Sejipang Kingdom had long wanted to compete with them. The Duke of the Kingdom of Damaniel clasped his palms together and smiled maliciously. He's glad they've come to an agreement. He offered to take a closer look at their plans. Meanwhile, in the castle of the Urnesia Empire, the king was sitting on a chair. He knew something was going on, but... The king asked, did these three countries really make a secret treaty? Their impure intentions were obvious. The king closed his eyes and put his fingers to his nose. They need to prepare. The king rose from his chair, a scroll in his hand. A storm is coming that will make the conflict of 30 years ago seem like a child's quarrel. However, this year the collected taxes in the army are several times higher than last year. The Arnesia Empire won't lose to them. The king shouted and held out his hand. He ordered official letters to be sent out to all the vassals. The younger boy was sitting on the grass, holding a piece of paper in his hand. A girl with a purple piece of cloth around her neck and a cone-shaped hat was looking at him. The hero wondered if he had overdone it. But no, he's sure he did it right. Daya asked the hero what happened. He doesn't like the walk. Errol was sitting on the grass, looking at the girl. His age is 15 years old. Errol closed his eyes and held his head. It seemed to him that something was wrong. He needed to meet his sister. I need to prepare myself properly. Here is a summary of the situation. Listen carefully. Duke Elgijan was pointing a finger at Errol. The Alliance was angry that this young guy was making too much money. They must work together to stop him. Goon and the Gelding stood with their mouths wide open. The Duke of the Merman Empire didn't like Errol from the start, and Count Sejipan said that he had an army and was willing to help. The three leaders looked at each other. They were all thinking the same thing. No one knew each other well, but this time, they are all willing to cooperate with each other to defeat that upstart. Errol pointed a finger at himself, smiling. So they formed an alliance. The Arnesia Empire will have to prepare for war. The hero was sitting on a chair in the castle, and the light fell on him through the windows. He can smell the evil energy in his direction. The girl with yellow hair was also sitting on the chair, reading the paper. It was written about the alliance of three states. But the Merman Empire used to be an ally of the Arnesia Empire. Kania imagined how she attacked the people from the alliance. If they're acting so suspiciously, maybe it makes sense to attack them first? The girl asked. Errol said it sounded good, but there was a problem. If they attack, they will appear as aggressors, because Arnesia has no evidence of the alliance's intentions. The hero was sitting across from the girl, and they were looking at each other. Errol said that the dukes of the three countries aren't stupid enough to leave footprints. The Arnesia Empire was already lucky enough to find out the secret of the alliance. Errol closed one eye and crossed his arms. He had expected it himself, but he had expected it to happen in about five years. It's even funny. Whatever the world is, the authorities are always the same. Who cares about people dying? That is why the military is still in demand. Errol closed both eyes and put a hand to his forehead. He didn't understand why it was so hard not to fight. It annoys him so much. The girl thought that the hero was not feeling well. Kania and Errol were sitting at a table with papers on it. The hero was just thinking. Until all this is confirmed, he wonders what the girl will do. She didn't understand why Errol was asking that. The girl was sitting on a chair, and some kind of glow was coming from her body. The hero thought that the girl would want to go back to the palace. Her father is very worried about her, even sent a letter. Errol was picking his nose, and next to him was Kania, who had bunny ears on her head. But he doesn't worry too much about his son. He doesn't want to send his sweet daughter to the battlefield at all. The hero was sitting in front of the girl with his left hand raised. He hadn't told her to run, but Kania would rather stay in the palace until the threat was gone. In an emergency, her princess status takes precedence over her knight status. The girl closed her eyes and crossed her arms. She's against it anyway. Errol didn't expect Kania to refuse so quickly. The hero looked in the direction of the girl and slightly frowned. This isn't a joke. If the situation worsened, 
They would have to fight to the death. The guy asked the girl if she was sure of her choice. Kania smiled. We are shown a girl sitting in front of a very young prince. The girl put her hands on the chair and smiled a little wider. She's not going to stand by just because she's a princess. It's all right. She swore to Errol to protect him. Even as a member of the royal family, why would she hide from danger? The girl asked. The hero looked at his sister in surprise. He didn't recognize her. Errol was wiping away his tears with a handkerchief. He can't believe their little princess has finally grown up. What are you talking about? Kania asked the question. The boy replied that he would tell his father that his sister was staying with him. The girl thanked him. In general, he could not convince his sister of the wrong choice. He did his best, Errol wrote. The father of the prince and princess held and read this letter. In the living room of Lord Fahilia's castle, a dark-haired girl was drinking a drink. Next to her were two other girls, one of them had white hair. The girl exhaled and said that the war is already a serious matter. Her friend who has white hair asked, Sena, you have real world war experience, don't you? Sane's face was a little red. It was all in the past. The girl had been to war twice, wandering along dangerous front lines, but those wars were just local conflicts, unlike the upcoming one. Sane opened her mouth slightly as she sat in front of the white-haired girl. She wondered how long Sane had been back home. A girl with white hair was sitting on a chair, and a mug was placed on the table in front of her. Sane had heard that the girl's younger brother had entered the academy this year. Maybe she wants to see him while she still can. The girl took a sip of her drink. She's not sure if this is the time for this, but she's sure her brother will understand. Sane was smiling and holding a mug of drink in her hand. She's not going on vacation herself. She just doesn't have much to go. The white-haired girl and Sane bumped their mugs together. They decided to have a drink. Who knows if there won't be another chance. Sane asked the purple-eyed girl, have you eaten everything yet? Shara pleaded that she was just very hungry. Isn't beer, is this something you can fill your stomach with? The blonde girl asked. The chairs in the room were filled with books. Errol was standing over the desk, sorting through the notes. He was holding a green book in one hand, and his eyes were fixed on the table. Even though he told his sister that nothing was clear yet, but according to his calculations, war would be declared on the Arnesia Empire within this year. In any case, you need to prepare now. The hero moved the pawns on the map. The alliance has a 30% chance of winning. As a military pro in past lives, Errol estimates somewhere between six or 700,000 soldiers. There were two colored pawns on the paper. Based on the fact that Arnesia is on the defensive, they will also have 600,000. It is difficult to talk about a clear victory in this battle. Errol dropped all the pawns by building a piece out of different chess pieces. In the worst case scenario, he will have to use dirty tricks. Errol raised a hand to his mouth. But even in the worst case scenario, all is well as long as he can defend himself in his fortress, the hero thought. Errol closed his eyes and leaned back in his chair. Now his main priority is to live in his own pleasure. The hero winked and smiled broadly. So a small, daredevil lord just has to come up with a plan to survive this war, right? There were two different colored chess pieces on the map. Then Errol decided to start by strengthening the troops. He decided to make it so that the alliance wouldn't even reach his land. All you have to do is make sure that no rat gets past you. Someone was walking through the snow in brown shoes. Errol opened the doors. He came to Aiken. An instrument flew by the hero's side. He realized that Aiken was in a bad mood today. The hero was waving at the old man, and behind him, an axe was sticking out of the door. Belatedly, welcome to Fahilia, Errol said. The hero asked the old man, does he have enough of everything? The man with the gray hair replied that he was fine with everything. It has state-of-the-art equipment and obscenely luxurious amenities. Then Errol asked what had happened to the old man. Aiken glared at the hero and raised the hammer to his face. He said the local blacksmiths were terrible. They don't follow orders. A flame lit up in the old man's eye. He hadn't slept because of them in about two days. It's just that ordinary people can't work that hard, Errol told him. The old man sat down on a tree stump, and behind him was an anvil. At least he got some good information about Bullet. The old man didn't think that his recipe was so simple. The hero said that this is great news, but the main thing is not to confuse the Gramovka. Aiken held his head in his hand. Errol went back to business. He came to make an order. The hero needs some weapons and would like them to start production right now. The old man replied that if the weapons were simple, they would do it without any problems. He asked me how many pieces I needed to make. Errol began to whisper something in the old man's ear. After a second, Aiken's eyes were very wide open in surprise, and the hero was smiling. Errol was standing by the door, arms outstretched. The hero ran to the exit, and the instrument flew past him again. The old man shouted after this guy that he was crazy. Aiken was looking at the hero with an incredibly angry face, and the blacksmith was trying to stop him. He asked the master to calm down, but the old man was furious. It was necessary to make weapons and armor for 20,000 soldiers. Do you even know how long it will take? Aiken asked. 
The hero's face was covered in sweat and he was wiping his forehead with his hand. At this rate, the old man will wring the hero's neck one day. He needs to be more careful. Despite this, Errol thinks that the blacksmith will do everything. We see three men who were dressed in suits, and one of them was wearing a white fur coat. So, the next step. The man in the white fur coat thought he'd never see Arella again. He greeted their special VIP client, Prince Arella. The hero stood in front of the man and smiled. He didn't expect to come here again. The employee was very surprised when he received a letter from the prince. He asked how many slaves the hero needed this time. Errol opened his mouth a little and said with a smile that this time the request would be the biggest. The man in the fur coat was touching his fingers and there was a drop of sweat on his face. He asked the prince not to worry about it. He already knows who he's dealing with. Errol pointed to the number 5. He needed 50,000 men, 10 times more than last time. Isn't that possible? Errol asked. The man broke out in a sweat. He stammered out the number. The slave trader stands and breathes nervously. Errol answers, what is it? You don't have one. The slave trader indignantly says that the fact is that the number of requests for slaves from the nobles has increased. They all hope to use the slaves as soldiers. About 2,000 to 3,000 people have already been sold. Errol replies that I'm sorry for the question, but will you also use all 50,000 people as soldiers? Not all of them, but he and his families buy them out, just like last time. It's just an approximate number that will be obtained according to his calculations, Errol said as he stood beside the exciting slave trader. The slave trader, nervously reflecting on what has been said, replies that it is true. He understands you, Mr. Errol. Errol, remembering the past, thinks to himself that what is it, he only cares about money. Well, as long as he had soldiers, protection was guaranteed. I'm sure the slave trader is just looking for a way to ask for as much as possible. Standing in front of the slave trader, Errol says you know he doesn't like idle talk. The slave trader is overjoyed and tells him that of course, this is the foundation of a serious business. Send the slaves to your estate right away. Errol says yes. How long will it take to gather all 50,000 people? The slave trader thoughtfully replies that it's about five days. Errol already says goodbye, saying that then he will personally call for them in five days. The slave trader replies in surprise that it will be troublesome. Let him bring them to you himself. Errol tells him that everything is fine, he will come himself. Standing outside the gate, Errol laughs to himself. Errol, already anticipating all this, thinks that he has a lot more work to do now. How difficult. So, he will have to prepare everything within five days. Well, it's time to take things in hand. Kania was sitting in the carriage and Errol looked in. Kania was going to accompany him. She asks him that he says he wants to go out for another five days. But, will everything be fine? Errol, standing confidently at the carriage door, thinks that the main thing is that she does not suspect anything. He wants to keep her busy so she doesn't give him too much trouble. Kania tells him that it's fine, but they'll come back to this conversation later. Is Errol suggesting that she take a walk around the capital? She was taken aback by his suggestion. He remembers that his sister is a princess, but because of rumors about the war, she does not go out. And she'd spent most of her life in the palace, so she is very interested in the world around her. I'm sure she still wants to see it. An image of a little girl sitting and looking out of the window pops into his mind. She asks him a little nervously, what's the city tour going to be? He, trying to cheer her up, tells her that yes, let's take a little walk there. And more, there's nothing to do here anyway, is there? The words hit her like a rock on the head. Kania hesitantly replies that he is right. She gave him her hand and said, just this once. Errol, in high spirits, helps Kania out of the carriage and says yes, of course. Passers-by walk the streets. In the market, sellers try to shout, thereby attracting the attention of passers-by. They run happily between the people in the square. Kania admirably says that she imagined everything much more. Errol excitedly replies that it's just the countryside. Hold on tight, sister. They stop for something to eat. Errol is standing behind Kania, holding a fried lizard on a stick. He doesn't like this kind of food. While Errol was dissatisfied, Kania tasted the grilled meat and was surprised by its taste. Passing by the fountain, Kania decided to ask, where else do they go? Errol decided to let her choose the next place she wanted to go. They stopped at one of the buildings that had a sign on it. A whole crowd of passers-by came there, which attracted the attention of the exhibition. Kania was standing in front of Errol, who was eating ice cream. She exclaimed, look over there, Errol. Errol asked her what was what. Looking at the signboard that said exclusive goods created by the third prince, silver-haired sage. Kania said in surprise that his creations were being sold there. She'd seen them before. Errol said he was sure. He was horrified when he saw what was written and said in surprise, what kind of nonsense is that? That silver-haired sage again. How embarrassing. Who made this up? Are they really his creations? And as he thought about it, he blushed with shame. Kania started forward, but Errol tried to stop her. He said let's watch something else. But Kania didn't stop. Curiously, 
Kania asks what else is there that sells swords. Behind him, Errol stood panting. They saw a room where a gun seller was standing and weapons were hung on the wall. The salesman greeted them joyfully and said, Oh my god, do you need a sword? Then you've come to the right place. Kania stood in front of the gun salesman and listened intently, her mouth hanging open. The seller says that there are products of famous dwarves here. All these swords are forged by them. You know how talented dwarves are, right? And only today there is a 10% discount. But Errol stared at one of the swords in silence. He suddenly said that it wasn't true. Even at a discount, it's dangerous to sell fake dwarf goods. The salesman turned to Errol in fright and began to justify himself, what are you talking about? The dwarves make them themselves. Kania, putting her hands on her hips, indignantly exclaimed, what what? Fake. Errol points to one of the swords and calmly says, sister, pour some mana into this sword. But don't overdo it. Kenya picked up the sword and said, What is this? Kenya started pouring mana into the sword, and the sword glowed with a purple light. A worried gun salesman and a calm Errol were watching, because he knew the sword was a fake. The weapon breaks in Kenya's hands. Errol says with a smile on his face that fake swords break if you use aura, right? The gun salesman, standing in front of Errol, began to justify himself in a frightened voice that there was some mistake. But Errol stood his ground and said that if you insist, you can check them yourself. The dwarves are just around the corner, and if he is wrong, he is ready to compensate for the damage. This was him speaking to the gun seller's face in a raised tone. The seller, almost crying with annoyance that his deception was revealed, fearfully began to apologize for this and said that they should finish this. Taking one of the daggers, Errol said, give me this and he'll forget about it. Kania was confused by his words, and the salesman got scared and said that be but this. Errol gave him an exasperated look, bared his teeth, and said, what else? Is something wrong? The salesman stammered in fright and said, ah, no way. S thank you for your grace. They left the store. Errol held a dagger in his hand and raised it to him triumphantly. Kania was looking at the dagger and asked that he liked it. He said confidently that it was a real dagger. It's just a dagger, but it's original. Holding the dagger out to Kania, Errol said take it. It's a gift from him. Kania said in bewilderment, what is it for her? Kania picked up the dagger and raised it to the sky in delight. Clutching the dagger, she confusedly thanked him and said that he was the only one who cared so much about her. Errol walked beside her, smiling, his hands behind his head. Looking at her, he thought that she was so happy, as if she had received the most gorgeous dress in the world as a gift, and his sister was a unique person. Kenia had been walking beside him all this time, blinking in embarrassment at such an unusual gift. A few days later, Errol and his 50,000 slaves were already standing at the entrance of the castle. Kenia leans down slightly and whispers in Errol's ear that it's not too much. Errol is a little surprised. What's wrong? He asks, and asks Kenia to just pretend that she is the commander-in-chief of an army of 20,000 soldiers and leads them into battle. Kenia presents herself in steel armor, with a beautiful sword in her hand, and behind her stands 20,000 soldiers in shiny armor. That sounds great, says Kenia affirmatively. Asya, Sena, and Daya are standing at the entrance of the castle, talking to each other. Asya tells her friends to go and meet Prince Errol. Sena smiles broadly, scratches her head, and replies that yes, they haven't seen him in days. As they approach the now open gate, a sudden bewilderment gripped them. Sena and Asya's faces twisted in surprise. Only Daya looked very calm. In unison, they exclaimed what it was. Errol was standing at the entrance, beaming with happiness. There was a huge crowd of people behind him. Laughing merrily, he shouted that he had returned and brought another 50,000 subjects. Errol and the whole crowd rushed into the castle. Asya held her head. She grumbled that she thought so, that she shouldn't have let him go alone. Sena was shocked by what she saw. She cried out, My God, there are so many of them. Even Daya was outraged by so many people. How do we feed them all? She asked. From the side, someone asked Dia, she only cares about that. Asya approached Errol and told him that she understood the need to prepare for war, but maybe they should hire professional warriors. Errol rolled his eyes and calmly and even with a touch of indifference said that the war, this is a long way off and there will always be enemies who want to destroy Fahilia. Looking at the depressed faces of Asya and Sena, Errol tells them to just trust him because he's never been wrong. Asya turned away from Errol's well-pleased face and said that she had no objections. Errol gives her a thumbs up and tells her, thank you for understanding. After saying this, he points his finger at the crowd of people behind him and says that he will still need their help in training these people. He will make them excellent Fahilia warriors. Next, Errol began to imagine the scheme in his head and say that they would simply select useful guys, create a squad and train them. While thinking about this scheme, he says that he will prepare a basic training manual and they will direct them. He turns to Asya and Sena and asks if they can handle it. Basking in the sunlight, Asya and Sena proudly and firmly answer, that's right. Standing in front of Sena and Asya with a stony face, Errol begins to think that this is great, he will be very busy for a while. 
He represents the leaders of three countries and thinks that the leaders of the alliance of three countries decided to play with him. Just let them show up. Errol will personally place them on his lap in a row in front of him. The hero was walking on the grass and behind him was Daya. It was difficult for them to climb. Why do all magicians live in the mountains? Errol asked. Daya was looking at the hero who was holding onto a crutch. She replied that most of these magicians were just very old-fashioned people. Young magicians like the girl prefer to live in big cities. We see hills that were illuminated by the sun. Daya loves the city because the mountains are boring and there is nothing to eat. Errol agreed with her, but was surprised that the girl was only confused by these two reasons. A professor with glasses and a pen was standing in the library. He and the hero and the girl haven't seen each other in person for a long time. He wondered what had brought them to him this time. Errol held up the index finger of his left hand and said it was nothing special. The hero just wants to buy something, but he immediately warned that his request is not easy. The man asked what Errol wanted. A blue stone floated between the hero's heads. Errol needed a stone that could store mana. The hero wants to get at least in a class artifact. Such stones are registered with the magic tower. Due to the glare, the magician's eyes couldn't be seen through the glasses. He asked the hero why Errol had come to see him. The guy guessed that the man probably already understood everything by himself. But he said that the magic tower wouldn't sell him the stones. Errol stood with a serious face. The man asked him for what purpose the hero wants to use the stones. Mages are no different from mere mortals when it comes to war, but magical artifacts are quite another matter. The man adjusted his glasses. Errol asked the mage to understand him correctly. The hero just wants to protect his territory. The magician understands everything, but he still wonders why exactly he is being asked for such a favor. The hero smiled broadly and made a ring with his fingers. He knew that the man wasn't stupid enough not to understand. And as the man remembers, Errol will never be left in debt to him. The man raised his hand to his chin, and the boy looked at him and smiled. The hero thought that even though the magician pretends to be a snob, inside he is still the same miser. But at least he's not stupid and quickly draws the right conclusions. The man replied that this work will take some time. Errol happily said that there was nothing wrong with that. The hero was stretching while standing in the forest. Another problem solved. It seems that Errol has been working too hard lately, he wanted to get some rest. Beside him, suddenly, Daya fell to her knees. The hero didn't understand what she was doing. Daya recalled how Errol had told the mage about the cost of his work. The girl thought it was too much money. The hero replied that this is not a problem for him. He earns a lot of money. The hero whispered something in the girl's ear. After that, she stood there in shock while the hero smiled behind her. Errol told the girl how much money he had in total. The hero took hold of the girl's shoulders, and he hadn't even added the queen's stolen treasure to it. In any case, there's nothing to worry about. The hero said that it was time for them to return to the castle. Some time later, in Fahilia, a guy placed a piece of paper on the table in front of the mages. He said that it was time to start working, because magicians have an important mission. One of the mages picked up a draft paper and studied it. Errol explained that they needed to prepare everything before the war started, and that it was also confidential information. He hopes that the mages will keep it a secret. The mages were very scared. Errol smiled uncertainly. It's time for magicians to learn about overtime, the hero added. Of course, their payment will be appropriate. The hero asked them not to be discouraged, because everything is done for them. And today, Errol decided to take a walk around the capital. The hero had his hands behind his back, and Asya was standing behind him. She asked what brought the hero to the capital. He said he just wanted to take a walk. Errol tugged on the girl's arm. In preparation for the war, he made various deals every now and then. There were beads of sweat on Asi's face. She was surprised. The hero and the girl were standing near the Golden Gate. Errol said it was the Imperial Academy. It was a four-story building that looked like a castle. Asi's younger brother is studying here. The girl must see him at least once. Errol started to open the gate. Imperial Academy, an educational institution accredited by the Imperial family to teach the children of nobles. Although high-ranking aristocrats still hire personal tutors, most of their children still study at this place. Errol and Asya walked together, and the hero told her something. The girl started to say something to him, but Errol cut her off. When he gives a girl time off, she keeps telling him that she has a lot of work to do. Did she really not want to see her brother? The hero asked. Asya was looking at the floor. She said the prince shouldn't have come with her. Errol asked her not to be so stubborn. He's not that insensitive an employer. The hero held a card with a red circle at the top between his fingers. He's got the passes ready. Asya was very surprised. The girl and the prince were standing on the bridge in the academy. Only children of noble birth study here. The hero thought that he still didn't know anything about Asya's brother. The hero held his hands behind his head and Asya stood next to him with her eyes closed. Errol asked her where they could find the girl's brother. Asya replied that she didn't know the exact location. 
but if she sees him in the crowd, she'll tell him right away. They say that he is very similar to a Xia. Among the other kids, there was a guy with a green notebook and blonde hair. Errol noticed him and asked what about him. The faces of the girl and the prince were surprised. Asya recognized him and her brother's name escaped her. So the brother's name is Ayers. Great, the hero thought. In front of the girl's brother, there were three girls. They glared at him. Ayers was standing by the window, his face drenched in sweat. One of the girls asked him if he had thought about her offer. The boy replied that he had thought about it, but it was difficult for him. This can't be happening. Even in places like this, there are bullies. Errol tried to help the boy, but Asya stopped him. She asked the hero to wait a bit. The girls left airs. The boy exhaled and wiped his tie. Asya went to her brother and took him by the shoulder. She asked her brother what was going on. Ayers looked at his sister in surprise because he didn't understand how she got here. Asya didn't understand what these girls wanted from her brother. In the letter, he said that everything was fine with him. But what had Asya just seen? Ayers' sister was a little scared and the boy held his notebook in his hands and closed his eyes. She wanted to understand what the children wanted from him. But the boy said he wouldn't say anything. The girl sat down next to her brother and was confused. Errol suddenly stepped between them. It was the first time he'd seen Asya look so confused. The hero asked the girl to slow down and let him talk to the boy himself. Errol walked over to brother Asya and took him by the shoulders. He introduced himself as his sister's boss. Ayers recognized him and decided to check with the hero. Is he the third prince? Errol asked me to drop the titles for now. The hero leaned over to the boy and asked what it really was. Maybe they're bullying the boy, the hero thought. He was talking about that girl who molested Asi's brother. The boy replied that it was not so. Errol and Ayers touched their thumbs. The hero said that he would keep it a secret from the boy's sister. Ayers had beads of sweat on her face. He told me that the girl's name was Haya Kert. She is the youngest daughter of the Marquis of Kert. Errol had heard the name somewhere before. The hero held his hand near his chin and remembered how he communicated with a man who had light-colored hair. On his birthday, he met this Marquis. He didn't look like a bad nobleman, Errol thought. The hero stuck out his tongue and Ayers screamed with his eyes closed. Errol asked, So this girl is bullying my bodyguard's little brother. The boy looked away and began to talk. She, Ayers remembered hands pinning him to the wall. Errol asked brother is he to tell him quickly. The girl in the dress was standing in front of the boy. Lady Carrot was looking at the hero and one of her teeth was visible. She said to the boy, Ayers, let's date. Brother as he began to cry. He said the girl wanted Ayers to date her. Errol was in shock and he had a pen and paper in his hands. Ayers was shocked. He started running away and shouting that he didn't want to because he and Lady Carrots were only 11 years old. Carrot was very displeased. Errol thought about it while Ayers cried. Ayers said that at the time, of course, he rejected her, but she continued her courtship. According to him, the other ladies in the class also treat Ayers like a pet. He remembers with sadness how the ladies pay attention to him in every possible way. Ayers looked down and said that they weren't bullying him, just that he thought they were doing too much. Errol thought that Ayers just didn't realize how popular he was. Errol sighed heavily, because he was tired of just thinking about the relationship between children. Ayers turned away and said he just didn't know what to do with her. Suddenly, Errol pointed to Carrot and asked why Ayers didn't ask her. Ayers was shocked and asked her how long she had been standing there. She said she was back because she had something to say to Ayers. However, first she asked him about who all these people were. Errol scratched his head and said that they weren't some sort of suspicious person. Then the hero pointed to Asya and said that Carrot was actually her future sister-in-law. Asya was shocked and asked him how to understand this. Ayers was also displeased. Carrot said she knew they were Ayers' older sister, and she'd already heard about them. Meanwhile, Errol was whispering something in Asa's ear. Carrot then greeted them and introduced herself. Her name is Haya Kert, and she is the youngest daughter of the Kert family. After Haya introduced herself, she added that she wanted to date Asi's younger brother. Asiya was shocked, but Errol just happily said that it was cool and quite bold. Asiya was confused and asked Errol what she should do in this situation. Errol said that if there was no enmity between their families, then why not leave it up to the two of them? However, Asiya exclaimed that Ayers was saying that Haya was forcing him. Errol noticed that Ayers never said he didn't like it. According to Errol, it looks like Ayers is just confused and doesn't know what to do. Errol then said that the Kert family has an exceptional ability to make a profit through the right investments. According to him, if Ayers gets along with this girl, it will benefit their family. Asiya was sad and thought about this reason because she didn't like it. Errol immediately said it was secondary. He asked if the kids liked each other, why didn't Asiya just leave it at that and just watch the situation unfold? Asiya replied that this is true, but she has a question. Asiya asked if he didn't mind Haya, then why Ayers refused to meet her. Errol suggested that it might be because of male pride, but at the same time, he wondered if there was any other reason. At that moment, a green-haired boy approached Ayers and Lady Kert. 
He was very displeased and started yelling at Ayers, accusing him of flirting with Lady Cardigan. Lucen was very angry with Ayers. He asked if someone like Ayers dared to seduce Lady Cart. However, Haya immediately stood in front of Ayers and rebuffed Lutzen. She exclaimed that she was asking Ayers out herself. Lucen irritably shouted that he was against it. He asked her why she refused to communicate with him and why she chose Ayers. Errol was shocked, he realized it was a love triangle. He wondered what was going on here at all. Lucen continued to talk irritably about how Ayers' family was in decline, and the eldest daughter even went to work in the village. Lucen exclaimed that Haya would disgrace her family if she dated Ayers. Errol said the worm was already crossing the line. Ayers urged Lutzen to stop insulting his sister and Lady Kert. However, this made Lutzen even angrier and he swung it. But a moment later, Errol grabbed his arm and asked if he should change the subject. Errol said that if you kept poking your nose into something that wasn't your business, sooner or later it would be torn off. Lucen asked why Errol was even bothering, since they didn't ask outsiders. Errol replied that at least he had permission to enter. At the same time, someone approached them. A green-haired man approached them and asked what all the fuss was about. Morella was already bored with the fact that so many people were gathered there. Lucen, seeing his brother, was very happy and beamed with happiness. Errol said that Lutzen's brother looked more like a teacher than a student. Lucen's older brother asked Errol who he was. The hero replied with a smile that he had been waiting for this question. He bent down a little and introduced himself as the third prince of the Ernesia kingdom, as well as the owners of the village called Fahilia. Lutzen's older brother was shocked and wondered why the prince was here. The man was uncomfortable and asked if Errol would like to move to another place to continue their conversation. And so, after a while, they were sitting in another room. The green-haired man apologized for his younger brother's behavior. He said that Lucen would offer them a formal apology later. This man's name is Cato Lucen, the eldest son of the Lucen family, and he is also a fencing teacher at the academy. Errol said you should apologize to Ayers, not to him. However, Cato replied dryly that he was not involved in this matter. According to him, moreover, Ayers himself started it first. He asked if it was the Pernal family that should apologize in this case. Asya was confused. She said she was sure Ayers hadn't done anything wrong. Errol reflected that he was wondering where this childish love triangle came from. But now he seems to know what the reason is. Although the Royal Academy is an educational institution, it is more of a place for young nobles to build connections, rather than just learn. Errol assumed that this child was also just following orders from his family. At first, there may have been another reason, but over time, even the right goal can become a bad one. Cadel said that the Carrot and Lucien families have long had a close relationship, and therefore the Pernals should not interfere with this. Errol was outraged that an academy teacher would behave like this. It also infuriated him that they saw the Pernal family as nothing more than an obstacle in their path. Errol stood up indignantly, leaning his hands on the table and saying that Cadel was talking nonsense. Errol approached Cadel and asked him what the last name had to do with children's relationships. He wondered if teachers still taught discrimination in their day. However, Cadel calmly replied that the difference in rank couldn't be ignored in any case. According to him, it is the direct duty of a nobleman to make appropriate connections. Errol then asked if Cadel knew that Asya was his personal knight. He asked if Cadel was trying to say that a knight of the royal family was lower in rank than him. Cadel was shocked. He headed for the exit and said that he would warn his little brother. Cadel added that he hopes that the Pernal family will continue to refrain from actions that may cause misunderstandings. Errol was angry, because he knew Cadel would have his own way anyway, so he ordered him to return immediately. Cadel was horrified. Errol happily said that with Suham, Haya was interested in Ayers, and Cadel's brother was preventing it. The hero suggested solving this in the traditional way. Errol talks about the easiest way that has long been used by nobles in solving such love problems. Cadel and Asya were perplexed and excited. Cadel asked wordly if Errol was trying to tell him that they should have a duel. Errol exclaimed that all this was true, and that they should just have a duel and make a decision. He said that the eldest daughter of the Pernal family would fight against the eldest son of the Luzon family. The hero added that the younger ones will also participate in this. However, Cadel waved his hand and exclaimed that this was just nonsense. But Errol said he wasn't done yet. Errol added that if Cadel wins the duel, the hero will not only retreat, but also actively help in a difficult situation with food shortages due to crop failure. Cadel asked in shock if this was true. Errol decided to add something else. He said that Asya and Ayers should win from their side, only in this case they will win. And if at least one of them wins from the side of Lucene, then this will already be considered a victory. Cadel started to think that it was somewhat spontaneous, but if they won, it would be doubly beneficial for the family. In addition, Cadel was completely confident of winning, as his younger brother is two years older than Ayers, and he has a larger build. In addition, since Cadel was previously an officer of the 13th Order, he is confident that he can easily defeat a simple escort knight. Cadel bowed and said that since the prince personally offered, 
he had no right to refuse. Errol happily swore on the honor of the Arnesia family that he would keep his word. Asya clutched her head in horror. Asya was outraged and started yelling at Errol, saying that usually she lets him get away with it, but now the situation is different. Errol said that she usually just grumbles and asks you not to do that. But Asya again exclaimed that it wasn't about that. Errol said he knew she was going a little overboard, but he asked her if she really didn't mind what Cadel had said. Asya was confused. Errol said Cadel made fun of their family, disrespected heirs. He asked her if it was normal for her brother to be treated like a stone on the side of the road. Asya hesitantly said that she was Errol's bodyguard and couldn't be guided by her own personal feelings. Errol exclaimed that this was true and said that ignoring his bodyguard was like ignoring him. Errol also added that he wasn't going to stay silent when he or his people were insulted, so she might consider this the beginning of the end for the Lutzens. Errol happily asked her if she wanted to give the nasty worm a good beating, too. Errol was very happy and offered to show his younger brother Asi how much of a cool knight his sister was. Asiya was tense. However, she breathed a sigh of relief and agreed with Prince Errol. Then we see Ayers whining and talking about how he can't beat Lutzen. Errol genuinely didn't understand what was so difficult about children's fights, so he told Ayers to just go first and finish. Ayers, however, continued to whine. Suddenly, Errol put his hands on Ayers' shoulders and asked him to answer honestly. Errol said that in his vision, Lucen was constantly bullying Ayers, so he asked if it annoyed Ayers. The boy replied that he was angry, but when he thought of his sister, who was working for the reputation of their family, he couldn't afford to act recklessly. Ayers said he couldn't think of anything better to do than hold back and build up his strength. Errol replied that it was true and that it was also an option, but asked when Ayers would be able to change the situation. Errol started pushing the boy so hard that he even started crying. Errol said that it would be too late and that you need to be able to solve problems on the spot. He added that if Ayers constantly held back and waited for a good chance, he would soon be covered in mold. He cheered up Ayers and said that this was his chance and that he needed to show what would happen if they hurt their family. Errol said that of course he doesn't encourage Ayers to fight all the time, because it usually ends badly but asked him to take into account that the third prince himself will support him now. As he finished, Errol put his arm around Ayers. After such a rousing speech, Ayers' eyes shone and he was happy. Errol smiled slyly, for his strategy had worked. Then the hero began to tell Ayers a plan that the boy would definitely win with. Errol said that duels are cool only in words. In fact, something more barbaric is still to be found. This is a public display of violence that occurs by mutual consent. Of course, this attracts a lot of onlookers and gossips. Errol chuckled and said that even if the kids were fighting, everyone up to and including the old people was ready to watch. Errol took the worst place. Haya came up to him and expressed her indignation, because no one asked her and they immediately called a duel. Errol apologized for not warning her, and said they just really wanted to teach him a lesson once. Haya exclaimed that she would like to do it too, but it's not a good way. After all, Ayers says that he doesn't know much about fencing. Errol denied it and said that she didn't understand anything. According to the hero, it doesn't matter if Ayers is a swordsman or not. Haya was surprised and said that abilities were important here, as it was a duel. However, Errol continued to deny it. Meanwhile, Ayers was already standing ready with a wooden sword in his hands. Errol said that cunning is a really important attribute. According to Errol, Haya herself should figure it out soon. Errol asked her why she liked Ayers at all, since Lucene was more suitable for her family. Haya started talking about how Ayers was really cute. This surprised Errol. Haya said that when she pinches him, he makes a face like he's going to cry. According to her, she just wants to pinch him and watch his reaction. Haya blushed and said that she would just eat it. Errol was horrified. Lita Kert's thoughts startled him. Errol thought that there were more and more reasons to cancel this duel. At the same time, the judge, with the third prince's permission, declared the duel open. He told the participants to get ready. The referee gave the signal for the start of the match. Lucen immediately lunged at Ayers as he shouted for Ayers to die. Haya watched this and was unpleasantly surprised by Lutzen's behavior. Errol used some sort of magic and ordered Ayers to take half a step back diagonally to the right. Thus, Ayers managed to evade the attack. Lucen was shocked, he missed. Errol continued to give instructions. Lucen missed again. After a while, Ayers became tired and dizzy. However, he continued to follow Errol's instructions. And so he struck Lutzen with his sword. Lucen stumbled and fell to the ground. The other kids watched and were surprised that Ayers dodged all the attacks. Asya breathed a sigh of relief. Errol, meanwhile, was gloating as he quietly instructed Ayers in his ear. This was possible because Errol had created a small communication port exclusively for them. It was also important that Errol could easily predict what Lucen would do, because children only move as they are taught, and therefore, for Errol, their steps are as obvious as in a textbook. Errol praised Ayers and told him to keep moving as Errol suggested. Ayers was tired, but he was ready to keep fighting. Lucen stood up and started shouting. He was very angry that someone who he thought was a brat would be able to defeat him. 
With a shout, Lucen leapt up and swung back to strike. Ayers was terrified, but Errol calmed him down and instructed him to bend low and attack sharply upwards. And here is the crucial moment. Ayers did what Errol told him to do. Haya was surprised. Ayers slammed his sword between Lutzen's legs. Lucen passed out in shock. The referee was also shocked and announced that Ayers Pernal had won. Errol said it was easy, and Ayers was thrilled. Cadel, passing by Errol, said that it couldn't be helped if his younger brother lost, but Errol's jokes were too cruel. Errol pretended not to understand. Cadel said that on the whole, he might have guessed that Errol would stoop to gimmicks. So Asya and Cadel fought a duel. Cadel said that one way or another, he would win and put an end to it. Ayers, meanwhile, ran to Errol and exclaimed that he had done it. Errol complimented him and said he did a great job. Ayers ran to him and took his hands. She embarrassed him by exclaiming with delight that she believed in his victory. Errol looked at her with disdain and was surprised that Haya Kert wasn't lying and blushing. Although the fight was over, Ayers' excitement did not go away, because now his sister will fight. Ayers wondered if everything would be alright, since Ayers had heard that Lord Cadel was the former head of the Order of the Thirteen Knights. Errol confirmed this and added that it was clear that Cadel was confident in his abilities, but asked about what changes this makes. According to him, Asya will still win this battle. The third prince put his arm around Ayers and pointed at Asya, telling him to watch carefully. Errol exclaimed that his sister had become a knight for a reason. Meanwhile, Cadel told Asapernal that he wasn't going to give in, so he asked her to fight with all her might. Cadel immediately charged at Asya with an attack. He thought about how he never underestimated his opponent. Cadel thought that even if he suddenly lost, he would at least give it his all. However, a moment later, Cadel was already flying through the air from Asya's punch. Cadel was stunned. He wondered if there was something wrong with his eyes. The impact was very strong, because Cadel was thrown back with considerable speed. Cadel hit the wall and passed out. Asya, while simultaneously spinning her spear, said that she wanted to say that she would also fight at full strength, but it seems that this is already superfluous. She said Cadel didn't have much grip on the punch for his status. Asya breathed a sigh of relief. She asked Prince Errol to tell her if he did anything else like this in the future. Errol smiled and said that thanks to him, her brother was now respected. The hero pointed a finger at himself and winked at Ace, saying that thanks to today's fight, he would no longer be offended. He added that he would take care of the Lutzens himself so that they would talk less in the future. He told Asa that she could relax because he would do it himself. Asya was glad. She said she should thank Errol. Some time passed. Errol reflects that when people are confronted with something bad, they all try to deny the situation first. According to official information, the lords of Arnesia have begun recruiting and training soldiers to prepare for war. But their actions are too cautious to call them a full-fledged preparation. And what if we prepare for war, and there will be no war? Then all the accumulated supplies and weapons will end up in the warehouse, and it will be troublesome. In short, a real headache. Perhaps that was why there were so many people pointing out the lord who had decided to prepare in advance. Errol confidently said to prepare for war as much as possible. But whether there would be a war or not, no one really knew, so they continued to live as usual until we finally heard the news. And so we are transported to the capital of the Merman Empire. Emperor Merman told the people of the empire that he was going to make a statement to all the peoples of the continent today. He asked the residents if they knew that there was an enemy who was undermining the people's finances. People were surprised, of course. The emperor said that the enemy not only makes an undeserved profit by producing all sorts of fancy products, but also sells paper, the empire's signature product, at will. The emperor clenched his fist and said viciously that this was simply indescribable impudence. He took out his sword and exclaimed that this villain hails from the Arnesia Empire. Raising his sword, Emperor Merman said that in the name of the peace of their continent, he and all their allies who were also affected by this pest would draw their swords against this villain. With Merman was the ruler of the Kingdom of Damaniel, as well as the Grand Duke of the Principality of Sejapan. They crossed swords. The emperor exclaimed that he was announcing that their empire, along with their allies, the kingdom of Damaniel and the principality of Sejapan, were going to judge the Arnesia Empire together. The people cheered, and the rulers stood with their swords crossed. After some time, the emperor received a letter. In this letter, it was written that if they want to stop the shedding of innocent blood, they must stop making paper as soon as possible and close all production facilities. Share with the secret recipes of the unique products of the kingdom of Arnesia, they must also distribute the profits made from the products to all countries, and finally transfer Prince Errol abroad to study in order to discover all his talents. The emperor was furious, wondering if they were bullying Arnesia. The emperor was ready for war and ordered the troops to be assembled immediately. He exclaimed that this was the land that their ancestors had defended, and therefore they would not give up an inch of it. We are transported to the border of the territory of the Kingdom of Arnesia, to the fortress of Bezian. We see the troops who rushed to the attack. Some guy said that the union of the three kingdoms has finally arrived. 
The action takes place in the main palace of Ernesia. This guy turned around and asked about what the scouts were reporting. The soldier told him that if you count together with those from the northeastern border, they say that they will attack about a hundred thousand. This guy knew that it wasn't over yet, because the main troops would surely follow them. He thought that as the heir to the empire, he must stop them at all costs. The prince exclaimed that if they rallied, they would have nothing to fear. He suggested that they make sure that even the ant could not get into the fortress. The real battle has begun. Errol's order to mobilize hasn't been issued yet, but at this moment, when everyone in Fahilia is ready and waiting for the enemy to finally appear, Errol is busy as hell. Errol, meanwhile, was sitting across from Daya. Errol lifted the dome and a piece of meat poked out from under it. Errol said it was time to unleash your culinary talents. Daya was thrilled, and her mouth watered. The dish looked incredible, it's a stew of tender rabbit meat. Errol said it tasted so good, and when everyone found out it was rabbit meat, they wouldn't eat it. Daya said they were saying that because they hadn't tasted insects and poisonous mushrooms since they were hungry. After a while, Errol said they'd had a good meal. Errol asked his subordinate if he should prepare something else. Daya asked him what he was going to do. She looked at the ingredients and said that it would probably be something sweet, because Errol uses wheat flour and dried fruit. But Errol said it was a firm secret. Daya continued to watch Errol. At the same time, she couldn't help but wonder that he was such a good cook, since usually lords didn't even show up in the kitchen. Errol exclaimed that he actually created recipes for all the products that their company sells. Errol turned around and said that he hadn't told anyone about this, but he had a period when he thought that if it didn't work out, he would go into hiding and become a chef. And then, after some time, I pulled the food out of the oven. He said the dish was ready. Daya took a bite. She was thrilled, but said that it seems to her that if you eat a lot of it, you can gain weight very quickly. Errol said he came up with this idea when he was composing dry rations for soldiers on the battlefield. According to him, the usual camping food doesn't taste good, so if something goes wrong and Errol has to eat it, you need a backup plan. Daya spoke worriedly about the fact that Errol still hadn't issued the mobilization order. However, Errol scratched his head and said that he just wanted to finish his training as much as possible. He excitedly said that he wanted to do it while there was still time. Meanwhile, the fighting was already raging. The soldiers were fighting each other. Enemies were climbing the fortress. The prince was shouting that it was time to launch a counterattack, so it infuriated him that the reinforcements still hadn't arrived. The soldiers told him that reinforcements were coming. However, the enemy kept climbing the wall, and they knew that it would be difficult to attack in such a situation. Suddenly, a soldier ran up to the prince, who had an urgent message from intelligence. The soldier said that the enemy army is approaching and there are 210,000 of them. The prince was shocked and stunned, and now we see this huge army. The prince was stunned, he didn't expect that there would be so many of them, much less that they were already here. We are transported to the council chamber of the Ernesia Empire. The emperor and his subordinates were seated at a table. The emperor was exhausted, and his subordinates were arguing loudly. However, the emperor was angry that the number of enemy troops continued to grow. His subordinates were saying that it was only a matter of time before they would smash them to smithereens. One of his subordinates exclaimed that it couldn't go on like this. This subordinate said that it was better to retreat and reform the front line. The green-haired subordinate said that the emperor's safety was paramount. The emperor was annoyed, but agreed. He ordered his subordinates to withdraw the front line, as well as try to convey to the people the full gravity of the current situation. The emperor stood up and held out his hand, shouting for even feudal lords and nobles who were capable of fighting to come out. The emperor decisively ordered all forces to be mobilized. Errol thought it was amazing that his older brother still decided to take part in the dream for the sake of achievements. After all, usually representatives of the imperial family are not sent to the front. Errol received a summons, which was a bit unexpected for him. He realized that three on one was still tough. Still, there is nothing worse than a numerical advantage. Errol stood up and said that if he was to continue to do this nonsense, the empire needed to flourish. So he decided to temporarily become a private. Leaving a few soldiers in the manor, Errol began preparing to enter the battlefield. Errol patted his eagle fry and said it was time for him to go out on a big mission. Kania was standing next to Errol. He told her that she could stay in Fahilia. However, Kania exclaimed that she also wants to. It infuriated her that the others could do it and she couldn't. Errol thought she was stubborn. Errol knew that her swordsmanship skills would be useful in a war, but who in their right mind would want to send their loved ones to the front? Errol knew that if it was to protect the estate, perhaps their father would put pressure on her. Suddenly Kania patted Errol. She put her hands on his shoulders and thanked him for taking care of her, but she wouldn't let him go to war alone. She said that if the younger one is coming, then the older sister is also in business. Errol smiled and breathed a sigh of relief, saying that if she thought so, he wouldn't hold her back any longer. Errol said he thought it was time to give her something. Suddenly, he drew his sword. Errol handed it to Kania and said that Lady Finalia had entrusted it to him. 
Kania was shocked. A sword passed down from generation to generation in the Kenzis family. He got his name Kelsha from the first head of the family. Even the dwarves recognized its quality, noting that it was extremely difficult to create such a treasure. Kania asked if she really could take this sword. Errol replied that she was the third swordmaster in the kingdom, so no rejection was accepted. Kania stared at the sword in awe. Errol decided that he wouldn't stop her from admiring him. As he left, he thought that it was important to get out of here in a gentlemanly way. He realized that his task now was to reduce the number of victims as much as possible. Errol thought that there was no better reward for a valiant warrior than saving the lives of his men. Therefore, Arella should never be alarmed. Standing in front of the crowd of soldiers, Errol exclaimed that they were moving to the front on His Majesty's orders. Errol had reported that the enemy force was 320,000 strong, but Errol had not trained them to fall in battle. Errol shouted that he didn't need a safety net built on their sacrifices. He exclaimed that they must survive and defend their military merits. He also said that their manor's troops are only 23,000 strong. He said he wanted that number to remain the same after the war was over. Then we are transferred to the front line, to the northeast, near the fortress of Derzia. When the heroes arrived, they saw wounded soldiers. Errol realized that the battle was much harder than he had expected. Errol put his hand to his heart and greeted the crown prince. Kania also greeted him. The crown prince apologized for having to connect them. He said with shame that if he had managed properly, this would not have happened. However, Errol thought that despite the enemy's numbers, it was strange to say such a thing. Errol realized that compared to the Empress, his older brother was clearly a good person. Errol said he had heard that the current situation left much to be desired. The Crown Prince confirmed it. He anxiously told them that their stronghold was being besieged by the enemy, all 320,000 men would be here soon. He also informed them that the enemy had temporarily fallen silent to reform. But tomorrow the battle will continue. Errol was thinking that the situation couldn't be worse. If Errol had been a couple of days late, this territory would have been taken over by now, too. The crown prince asked if Errol had 23,000 soldiers. He added that with them, they would be able to hold out until the rest of the feudal lords arrived. Errol was confused. He wondered if the crown prince was going to use his men, who Errol had invested a lot of time and effort into, as a human shield. The hero thought that this option is not suitable for them. Errol leaned on the table and told his older brother that there was no need to wait. Errol urged his older brother to stop just defending himself. Errol exclaimed that it was time to completely change the battle situation because you can't delay any longer. The crown prince said he understood Errol's feelings, but they were in a different position. Errol replied that he had prepared something for the occasion, so he suggested that the crown prince take a look at it for himself. Errol came out of the tent and they went somewhere. Along the way, Errol thought that as soon as news of the war reached him, he asked his blacksmiths to upgrade one of them. Seeing this, the crown prince was shocked. It was a mobile belvedere. Errol said it would house archers and mages. This is a prefabricated tower, so it is extremely convenient to move. The crown prince happily exclaimed that she really could help them. However, Errol said that's not all. The prince was shocked. He saw a building and asked Errol what it was called. The hero suggested calling it a blink gun on wheels. The hero thought that such weapons were often used in ancient times for sieges. It can help both in defense and put psychological pressure on the enemy. This model is even improved by Errol with the help of magicians and dwarves. The hero said that there are enough blades. According to him, it is only necessary to collect the basis and the weapon will be ready for use. Errol exclaimed that he would take over the defense and instructed his brother to focus on the counterattack. The crown prince was very happy. Errol smiled as he thought that the three hearts had crossed the road in the wrong way. He knew it was time for a counterattack. One of the commanders and chief of the army of the Union of Three States sits at a table and holds a huge piece of paper in his hands. Oni studies it carefully and notices that it looks like the enemy has reinforcements. Two other commanders and chief are sitting with him at the table at the front post of the Union of Three States. One of them says that the resistance is serious, judging by how smoothly they held off the onslaught of the first wave. The second adds that it is obvious that the crown prince is not as stupid as they assumed. The third says that this was not enough yet. One of them is sitting at the table, smiling broadly. Suddenly one of them asks him why he is smiling. He says that he was just interested in the boy who brought reinforcements. The second one looks at the first one with a puzzled look and asks who the guy is. Frowning, he says it's Errol Arnesia. He adds that Errol is the reason for the sharp enrichment of the Arnesia Empire and the outbreak of war. The other two commanders in chief jumped up in surprise and shouted in unison that he was here. The first man's face twisted with anger and envy. He imagined catching little Errol in his hand. He said that at first the rumor that some small-time guy had created these impressive products seemed like utter nonsense, but then suddenly there was a chance to verify their authenticity. He slams his snow-gloved fist down hard on the table and asks what his colleagues will say to that. 
They're interested, too, aren't they? One of the commanders in chief stammers that yes, but the status is Arella. The first one interrupts him and tells them not to worry because he won't break their agreement. Straining hard and clenching his hand into a fist, he continues to make sure that his colleagues are fully armed and it's time to destroy the enemy. Against a clear blue sky, armed with modified weapons, Errol's army, numbering approximately 23,000 people, stands. On the castle wall, under the scorching sun, Errol stands and looks at his army. Oh, wow, he says, fed up with the strength of his army and the army of the Union of Three States. About 50 members of the army of the Three States, breaking through the smoke, run towards the castle. Their armor is shining. They run forward, shouting. From the castle wall, Errol shouts to his warriors to act according to the plan, as they agreed. The Arella wars stand against the walls, covered with gilded shields, each with a red stone in the center. One of the warriors of the Union of Three States rides on horseback and shouts to the warriors of Arella that they are cowards since they cover themselves with shields. You need to crush them with all your might. Go ahead, he orders his soldiers. Rushing towards Errol's army, this warrior says that they are about to be attacked by an army of over 50,000 men. He adds that even the best strategist can't win such a battle. Suddenly, he stops abruptly and looks up. Hundreds, maybe thousands of magic arrows are flying over it. The army of the Union of Three States is very frightened by this turn of events. Some soldiers of this army manage to cover themselves with shields, but some are injured. Someone gives them a command to raise their shields. Defending himself from arrows with a shield, the soldier shouts that he is ordering that it is necessary to put aside fear and rush into the attack. Errol is standing on the wall, watching. He's not happy. It seems that this is not enough to crush them, he says. Two troops collide with shields. Dust rises on the battlefield. One of the Union soldiers leans on the enemy with all the weight of his body, but still cannot move them. He is overcome with excitement and bewilderment. He can't move forward and thinks that the shields of Errol's soldiers are clearly different from the usual ones. He wonders what they're made of. Suddenly, from behind the shield bearers of Arella, a cry is heard that now, clear the way. The shield bearers disperse and soldiers appear behind them, armed with a new weapon a blade gun on wheels. He sees the enemy soldiers arrive in shock. They are overcome with fear, and they shout that they are retreating, to the rear, quickly. Errol watches the crowd with pity, where shouts and groans are coming from. Taking a deep breath and closing his eyes, Errol thinks they should blame their brainless commander for everything. The enemy infantry can't keep up with Errol's troops, and one of their soldiers shouts about it and calls for magical support to fight. Gritting his teeth, he thinks it's a bit disappointing to have to resort to mages so soon. But they have no other options, because mages are much scarier than ordinary soldiers, and much more dangerous than even knights with auras. At this time, the enemy mages are already beginning to cast spells. The soldier keeps thinking that magicians' spells are real weapons of mass destruction, and knowing the value of magic and the mana limit, he wanted to hold them back. But, the warrior, sitting astride, points to the mages with his hand so that they go forward and orders them to hit at full power. He orders the mages to show that in the face of true power, the cheap tricks of Errol and his army won't work. Mages hold on tightly to their staffs and shine with spells, but their faces are very tense. The magician's hands emit a red glow. Suddenly, the mages stop. They are very worried and are in complete disbelief from what is happening. A soldier sitting on a horse shouts at them that he doesn't understand why they got up. He orders an attack and asks them if they have betrayed them. Stuttering and very worried, the magicians answer that this is not so. They say that magic doesn't work and something is blocking them. These words startle and shock the soldier on horseback. He resents that. The main mage says that the enemy also has mages. At this time, Arella's mages calmly conjure in their positions and say that everything turned out to be not so difficult, so much so that they wonder if there are definitely mages there. In response, the enemy mage says that he is a sixth-class mage. He continues to conjure. He says that with his fourth-grade skills, the mages of Arella are no match for him. He's very focused and intense. Magic waves are floating in the air. A soldier on horseback yells at his mages to do something. How long can they stand? Magicians, throwing up their hands, say that they can't, but the enemy will also not be able to use combat magic, since the magic block requires extremely large amounts of mana. Chief Mage Arella holds out her staff and says it's time to move on to the next stage. Suddenly, enemy soldiers are struck by lightning that comes from nowhere. A soldier on horseback yells at his mages that Errol's mages can use magic. The enemy's mages are gripped by intense fear. This can't be happening, no matter how much mana you have, they reply to the soldier on horseback. It's impossible to cast such a spell immediately after a block. Their eyes are filled with incredible terror and fear. What the hell, they wonder. Then they notice Errol's mages, resolutely conjuring from their tower on wheels. Blue mana light envelops them. Enemy mages notice the magic stone, the strongest among all. It is held in a silver wand and emits a bright blue light. 
The soldier on horseback is very surprised where a simple feudal lord got such a treasure. A wild fear seizes him. What the hell kind of monster is their leader? The soldier thinks. Suddenly, ice swirls appear against the blue sky. They instantly freeze the warriors of the Union of Three States. Wild screams, moans and cries for help can be heard in the crowd. The Union troops are overcome with panic and fear, and they are shouting that they are retreating. As a result, the enemy army lost 30,000 soldiers that day. Errol grins grimly at what's happening. Columns of dust swirl behind the wall. He turns and walks away from the wall. His face is sad. He thinks that once again he is convinced that winning a war does not bring joy. He wonders what all this senseless killing is all about. Looking at the clear and boundless sky, he thinks that now he would like to rest, and not all this. After coming down from the wall, Errol meets Asiya and Sena. Sena quickly asks Errol what they will do with the retreating enemy. Asiya is standing next to her. Errol replies that they will not pursue them. They needed to catch their breath, too. Abandoned soldiers, he offers to take prisoner. In one voice, Sena and Asiya answer that there is. On the golden sunset street, the sun is setting. His older brother appears in front of Errol. His snow-white royal robes with a red velvet cape simply shine. He laughs happily and tells Errol that this is what he understands to fight back. Well, brother, he says, well, he gives it to me. As he gets closer, he proudly declares that he is sure that even the enemy did not expect such a defeat. He says Errol's doing great. Errol wearily replies that no, he was just lucky. He says that he managed to deal with really strong enemies on his own. Brother Arella looks at him lovingly. Errol turned away from him. Errol is not happy. Errol thinks that his brother seems to misunderstand something. Errol wants to rest, not become a hero of the front, so all the honor and glory goes to his brother, Errol is not sorry. Errol imagines him lying contentedly on his side, resting, while his brother, with a crown on his head, basks in glory. Errol felt a little uneasy. Brother Arella clenches his hand into a fist. He proudly declares that their counterattack must have dampened the enemy's ardor and now is the time to respond. There are exclamations from the outside that it is true, that this is the right idea. Errol, with heartfelt warmth and affection, tells his brother to do what he sees fit. These words strongly support and motivate brother Errol. He's already glowing with happiness. There is an unwavering determination in his words. He says it's Arnesia's turn. Errol is standing behind his brother. He is very satisfied and happy. Errol thinks this is great, because while his bro is stirring up trouble in the enemy camp, he can hang out for a while. Looking at the golden sunset and the beautiful sky, Golden from the rays of the sun, Errol thinks that a holiday in the war for him is a trifle. He just needs to get up his ass. Fahilia flags flutter against the azure sky. The Imperial Army, led by Brother Yale, immediately launched a counterattack. The cavalry led by Yale moves into battle, raising columns of dust. The active activity of the Fahilia soldiers made it possible to divide the defense forces into three parts. Fahilia's cavalry rushes to meet the foot soldiers of the Union of Three States. To counter the numerical superiority, a battle of attrition was chosen instead of an all-out war. Yale dismounts and delivers a quick and precise blow to the trooper of the Tri-State Alliance. Yale's face shows rage and complete confidence in his actions. Meanwhile, in the rear, while the fierce battles continue, Errol enjoys delicious food and rests. He's happy. There are crumbs on his face. Errol is sitting at a table full of different dishes. Asya, Sena and Kania are sitting at the table with him. Errol just glows with happiness, holding in his hands a huge and incredibly delicious piece of baked chicken. Kania and Sena are also enjoying their meal, and they are also happy about what is happening. Asya eats carefully, she is thinking about something. Errol yells that the food is melting in your mouth. Kania says she hasn't eaten meat in so long, it's so delicious. Errol tells Sister Asa that there is still snow rabbit meat here. But before he can finish, Asa interrupts him and indifferently says that she will refuse. Sena, meanwhile, is enjoying a lovely drink from her large wooden mug. Her cheeks were flushed, sighing. Asa says that she somehow feels uncomfortable from the fact that blood is being spilled on the front line, and they are sitting here and resting. Sena looks at Asya and says, what's the big deal, in war, as they say, only the greyhounds survive. Well said, Errol exclaims enthusiastically, continuing to eat the tender meat. Many wooden carts stand against a huge brick wall. Due to the strategic advantage, Fahilia's army remained in the rear under the pretext that they were slow and if they were touched, they were lost. Errol ate heartily. He leaned back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. He thinks that yesterday's counterattack really made the Union tense up, so they won't go into this hive again. In other words, today you can do nothing with a clear conscience. Errol's face suddenly changed. 
Arcania looks at him in surprise. Errol starts talking, by the way. Errol looks at Dia. She got drunk and fell asleep lying on three chairs. A nod bone is visible from her mouth. Despite this, her face expresses happiness. She is happy. Errol says that Dia is fine as it is, so he can move her to a softer place. Errol and Kania look at Dia carefully. Errol says she squeezed out half the block herself yesterday. Consider it the most effort spent. Inwardly, Errol thinks that the absorption and circulation of mana from a magic stone consumes an extremely large amount of energy. That's why he told her to go rest, but she didn't. Errol remembers what it was like. Daya was leaning on her magic staff. There were terrible bags under her eyes and dimples in her cheeks, as if she hadn't eaten in weeks. She was trembling with helplessness. Daya told him that food first, sleep could wait. When Daya sat down at the table, she devoured the meat with a huge appetite and ate it with two hands, not noticing the others. Errol squints at how sweet and sound Daya is sleeping. Suddenly, Errol's face broke into a sweet smile. He said they would finish eating and go to bed. Errol smiles lightly, trying to hide his weariness. He says they have great things to do tomorrow. One of the members of the Union of Three States nervously examines the map. Privately, he thinks that everything is bad. He remembers Yale, imagines him commanding an army. The member of the Union of Three States thinks that the Crown Prince, who leads the army, of course, also bothers his eyes, but he still has milk on his lips. The real problem isn't him. Gritting his teeth, a member of the Union of Three States recalls Arella. He thinks the recent counterattack was too unexpected, but wasn't that guy just a salesman? A member of the Union of Three States is filled with anger. He can't believe that Errol's army of 23,000 people destroyed 30,000 of their soldiers out of 50. The member of the Union of Three States continues to reflect that the main thing in the martial craft is experience. But to understand its essence, it is much more important to experience the battle firsthand than to make plans in your head. He imagines Errol's serious face against the flames and continues to wonder how a 16-year-old could possibly do such a thing. Standing at a table with a bunch of maps, strategies, and emails, he is left wondering why he is sitting in the back. With his abilities, you can change the course of a war in no time. Frowning, the member of the Union of Three States remembers the name. Name of Arella Ernesia. He wonders who this guy is. Horse carts are moving slowly against the blue sky and green trees. The next day, Errol's army joined that of his brother Yale. They all go together, these two units, to recapture the fortress. In one of the carts rides Errol and Kania. Errol studies the map carefully. Errol shouts out the window at the trooper to slow down by half, they'll go a little slower. The soldier in shining armor replied, yes. Errol is not happy. Kania notices this and asks him what is the matter, something is wrong. Errol is silent. He's lost in thought. Errol tells Kania that he thinks they are already expected. Kania doesn't understand why he decided that. Errol tells Kania that the Union suffered quite a lot last time by attacking them head-on. Kania listens to him with displeasure and says that he is right. Studying the map, Errol adds that they are also not fools and will not step on the same rake a second time. What's more, Errol adds, they'll soon be passing through this place. He points it out with his finger on the map. This place is perfect for an ambush. The Union will not miss this chance. Errol looks at Kania sarcastically and says that if the enemy is preparing for an attack, then let them prepare for the consequences. Outside the window millet beautiful weather. The soldiers of Errol walk slowly along the planned route, stamping their iron-armored feet. They arrive at a ravine where Errol is waiting for an enemy ambush. Enemy soldiers are hiding among the trees. Their commander says that the enemy will come soon, everyone needs to get ready. This time, they must win. Enemy soldiers are standing in formation. They are ready to attack. The enemy is carefully monitoring the gorge. The enemy commander reflects that they are being delayed. He's been told that Errol and his army move rather slowly because they're carrying a watchtower, but not that much, he protests in his head. Suddenly, he notices something and becomes very tense. It can't be, he thinks. He sees Errol's army moving. Horses stamp on the ground with their hooves. Creaking wheels, the army approaches. The thought flashes through the enemy commander's mind that they are here. The commander of the Tri-State Union squad is shouting furiously, Charge! Hundreds of arrows start flying at the wagons and horses in an instant. They hit something in the air. This is a barrier. The commander of the Tri-State Union squad is confused. He's outraged, it's shield magic. The mage behind him reports that the spells aren't working, so it looks like it's a block again. The commander of the enemy squad was taken aback by surprise. He stands in front of his warriors and wonders how the enemy was able to use magic so quickly, had they prepared in advance. He shouts to them that there is no point in storming further, they need to retreat. Everyone rushes to run away. The commander shouts that it's faster, we're leaving. But before he can finish speaking, one of his warriors falls into a trap. A knight with a trap on his leg falls to the ground. Other soldiers also fall into traps. They did not expect such a turn of events and are surprised to think traps. Sena shouts that a skilled hunter knows how to set traps, 
and traps are known to catch people as well as animals. With bare fists, Sena rushes to attack the enemy. One of the soldiers looks at Sena, who is about to hit him with all her strength, flying at him and says that. Sena savagely punches him right in the face. Sena says that if you are preparing for an attack, then be prepared for the consequences. She reports that she is relaying the words of her leader. One of the soldiers pulls out a sword and tells her not to dare stand in their way. Sena looks at him with a stony face. The enemy squad leader pulls out his sword and furiously shouts that he won't lose to some wench. He lunges at Sena, yelling at her to die. Sena stands still and prepares to strike. A pink glow pours out of her fist. She strikes with lightning speed. Next to her, someone is twirling a spear in one hand. This is Asya. Holding the spear on her shoulder, she says that there is so much chatter, but in reality nothing special. In the wagon, Errol told Asya and Sena that they needed to show their worst side, and then the enemy would avoid them out of disgust, not fear. Errol came up with a brilliant idea, instead of making a fierce battle, they need to become an opponent who is more expensive to touch. This is his plan, which he told Asya and Sena. The ground is littered with arrows and thrown swords. Columns of smoke and dust rise above the ground. Errol's army successfully destroyed the suddenly attacking soldiers from the Union of Three States and recaptured the border fortress. Three Errol soldiers in shining armor stand on one of the towers of the fortress, remove the flag of the Union of Three States and hang the flag of Ernesia. The enemy tried to attack a few more times, but they couldn't break Ernesia's morale so easily. Errol's soldiers are eager to fight the wars of the Tri-State Alliance. They are brave, their morale is high. This breaks the will of the soldiers of the Union of Three States, so they are worried in battle and even afraid. Kania holds her sword, which glitters and emits a blue glow. She is full of determination. Kania was the one who gave the strongest rebuff to the opponent. Her red eyes look like they're looking right into your soul. Kania, against the background of a huge fortress wall, furiously runs at the enemy and hits them with her sword. The soldiers of the Union of Three States are shocked. One of them shouts that this terribly strong girl is really a princess, the rumors were true. Kania holds her powerful sword and squints at her enemies. She tells them back that there is not a single swordmaster among them. It's just that the masters are focused on the south, but there is no north on the front line, and they start laughing. The soldiers of the Tri-State Alliance were enveloped in a blue glow from Kania's attacks. They're screaming for help. Errol stands on the wall of the fortress. The flag of Ernesia is fluttering nearby. He's lost in thought. Several months have passed since the beginning of the war. The army of the Union of the Three States was losing both momentum and soldiers every day, and Ernesia was rapidly approaching victory. Morella's army has lost 121 soldiers so far and 142 are seriously injured. Another 192 people escaped with minor injuries. Errol sinks deeper into the fog of his thoughts. Compared to the other fiefs, where the dead numbered half of the entire composition, Fahilia's army showed a simply stunning result. At this time, the base of the general command of the Union of Three States. One of the three members of the Union of Three States sits at a table on the general command base. He has a black patch over one eye. He's obviously not happy about something. He says the battle is more or less even in the south, and only in the north their men can't even break through the defenses. This man says you can't keep wasting soldiers. He suggests that the detachments should be removed from the northern front line for a while. After these words, he stretches out his white-gloved hand to the chessboard and makes a confident pawn move. He says it's infuriating, but right now we all have to make this big decision. After these words, all the black chess pieces are swept off the board. Only the white shining queen remains on it. The member of the Union of Three States goes on to say that he is confident that their highness will understand their choice. He looks up and glares out of his one eye. He says this solution is necessary to eradicate the evil called Ernesia. Two other members of the Union of Three States are sitting at a table and frowning at the chessboard. I think it's time to use all your strength. Errol lies on one of the towers of the fortress he captured. Above his head, the bright sun shines and the endless dome of the blue sky glitters. He thinks it's been a bit quiet lately, and it wasn't long ago that they were working hard to get the fortress back. It represents the current situation in the form of military figures. His figurine stands on the wall of the fortress, and figures of Ernesia soldiers surround the army of the Union of Three States in the process of defending the fortress. He thinks that because their army has focused on defense, the other fief's shock troops have become very stressful to the enemy. Errol lies on the brick floor, admiring the queer sky above, and thinks that with both sides now shedding blood fiercely, they can significantly reduce their losses. He doesn't think the weather is right now for dying. Errol represents the evil main members of the Union of Three States. The Alliance of Three States invaded for their own benefit, hoping to capture Ernesia. Afterward, he imagines his brother Yale holding a proudly raised sword over his head. 
a bright light shines behind him. Errol thinks that even though they all have their own goals, they work hard for the sake of exploits. Errol represents a feudal lord confidently giving orders to his soldiers. After the situation has changed for the better, previously passive feudal lords are already confidently telling their own to kill as many opponents as possible. Errol continues to reflect. Errol imagines his brother Yale against a fiery sky, proudly holding a sword in his hands. Even his brother went into battle to show a decent image of the future king. Errol still lies on the cold stone floor of the fortress wall and thinks that the war broke out precisely because of greed. Errol imagines a man with a dagger in his hand trying to kill another person. Coins and jewels fly around it. Greed helps a person to rise higher, for the sake of his own selfish goals, he is ready to go to anything. After that, this person walks on a mountain of gold and bones. A greedy person does not care what lies at his feet, money, power or corpses. It just keeps striving for the top. Errol puts his hands behind his head and calmly thinks that if you think about it, you can call him greedy too. But looking up at the clear blue sky, he wonders if greedy people know that the sky will never change, no matter what lies under their feet. No matter how high you climb, eventually, and then his thoughts are interrupted by someone's speech. The shadow of a man looms over Errol. The man asks what Errol is hinting at this time. Raising himself up slightly, and propping his head on his hand, Errol sees that it is a sia. He says that he is lost in thought, let him choose his words. Asya replies that she doesn't ask him to stop lying around, and she asks him to keep his image in public, because the soldiers see everything. Errol lies back down and crosses one leg over the other. Asya stands over him. All this is being watched from the sidelines by soldiers. Errol squats down and smiles sweetly at Asya. He says that when you forget about the image, life is immediately easier. If she doesn't believe him, he suggests that she try it out with him. Taking her head to the side, Asya says that she will probably refuse, because she still has a lot of work to do. Asya directs her gaze into the boundless distance. She says that the enemy hasn't been attacking anything at all lately. Errol turns to look at her and says that she, too, thought the attacks had completely stopped. It's been quiet for six days now. Asya walks to the edge of the tower and continues to stare into the distance. The sun shines on her pretty face, and the wind gently blows her hair. She says that she would like the war to end there. Errol looks at her with big eyes and says nothing. Suddenly he says what they're up to. Walking to the edge of the basha, Errol puts two fingers in his mouth and begins to whistle loudly. Asya didn't expect this and shouts, Mr. Errol. Suddenly, in the sky, someone covers the sun with their huge wings. He slowly sits down on the wall of the fortress on his strong paws. Raising a strong wind, a griffon appears between Errol and Asya. Errol is completely calm, but Asya covers her face with her hands. Errol jumps on the griffon, and Asya shouts at him to stop, because it's dangerous. Errol calms her down and tells her that he will be back soon. With a sharp flap of its mighty wings, the griffon lifts Errol into the air. Asya shouts after him to stop Errol. Asya is very worried about Errol and looks languidly after him. She sees how fast Errol is flying away on the griffon. Yeah, she says. The griffon, cutting through the wind, quickly carries Errol across the sky. Suddenly, Errol's eyes are drawn to something below. Errol is in shock. He was right. The griffon looks at Errol and asks. Through a special device, Errol immediately communicates with Asya. He tells her to call Sena. He has news of further developments. Deep down, Errol knows that the war doesn't seem to end so quickly. From the green headquarters tent of Arella comes a speech, a serious question. Errol asks what course you think the Union is going to take. Sena assumes that they will attack head-on again. Asya also asks Mr. Errol to refrain from actions similar to the recent one. Okay, okay, Errol says quickly. Then he asks Sena how the enemy will attack if they have retreated. Sena is in a stupor. After some thought, she says that she just doesn't think the Union will suddenly decide to capitulate. That's right, says Errol, in the current situation, no surrender is out of the question. But why, he asks. Asya raises her hands and says, out of pride. Good girl, Errol says happily, handing her a pie and telling her that she can take a pie off the shelf for that answer. Asya holds out her hand to him, is perplexed, and says nothing. Errol begins to explain that the alliance of three states started the war by officially challenging them, so it won't back down even if things get very bad. He says it would be strange if the heads of the Union of Three States came to them and just apologized after insulting them. Errol imagines the three heads of the Union kneeling in front of him and begging for forgiveness. He adds that the peoples of these states would be very indignant at such a thing. Asya and Sena listen carefully to Errol. He says that this is the reason why the war will continue. But what will the Union do then? asks Errol. Leaning his hands on the table, Errol himself answers his own question that the Union will begin to mobilize, to summon troops en masse. Sena gets very tense and asks if it's not dangerous. Dangerous, of course, Errol says thoughtfully, 
but the Union, especially the Merman Empire, has an extremely high percentage of slaves. Errol represents the soldiers under the flag of this empire. So, Errol continues, we'll soon have hundreds of new enemies coming at us. This is an unexpected move. They barely repelled the main force. Errol imagines a tired soldier with a sword and shield in his hands. After that, he represents a whole wave consisting of soldiers. Errol says that there are still new ones suddenly appearing, and even in huge numbers. The enemy will now earn victories not by quality, but by quantity. Errol viciously says they are. He smiles wickedly and scratches his chin with a finger. It gives off a cold blue light. Errol says they're not finger made. Prince Errol walked in front of the girls. Even with an army of millions on the horizon, the main thing is to stay calm. There was a drop of sweat on Sane's cheek, and behind her, Asya was looking into the distance. The hero has prepared something for such cases. Only he, Aiken, and his father knew. Sana asked the prince what it was. The hero took the cloth and began to take it off. Errol said, Drum roll is a large crossbow for ultra-long-range shooting. Now it is directed towards the front line. Errol stood by his crossbow and held it. This crossbow can fire up to a hundred arrows per minute. Moreover, the arrows themselves are unusual. They are developed directly in their forge. The hero said that he gives a tooth, no royal scholar can do anything like that. Asiya and Sena looked on in surprise. They are impressed by the development of Arella. The prince exhaled. He made this crossbow, taking as an example modern military equipment. He didn't really want to use the weapon so soon, but there was no other way. If the enemy encroaches on their good, they should respond in kind. Mounted troops were marching down the street, close to the first line of defense of the Ernesia Empire. The commander of the army noticed that the enemy was quiet. Quite a long time has passed since the return of the fortress. How much longer are they going to defend themselves? The commander thought. All the same, the victory will be for them. The commander stared gravely into the distance as his warriors began to run to attack. The commander thought that now was the time to attack. If they successfully complete the mission, then their highness will recognize the warriors' exploits, so they will go on the assault. The commander sat on his horse and thought that he would take all the credit for himself. The imperial army was looking at the huge crowd of warriors who were running towards it, and the commander was scared. They couldn't believe it. This was the new Union army. The warrior was looking at his commander, who was shouting at him. The subordinate asked if they would attack. The commander replied that no, because there are a lot of opponents. He decided to retreat and send a messenger to the fortress. The Union mobilized all possible forces and launched another raid on Ernesia. A man with long white hair stood at the top of the fortress and shouted with his hand raised that it was necessary to stand at all costs. The border fortress must not be allowed to pass to the enemy again. It will not allow the alliance to sweep the line of defense with numbers without any strategy. A green-haired man stood in front of the mages and told them to start attacking the Arnesia advanced troops. One of the mages looked at him, and there were beads of sweat on his face. He said the spells didn't work. It looks like there's a block. The Union leader didn't understand how many mana stones this empire had. The leader shouted to his army that such a turn was expected. The mages must go back, and the soldiers must go on the attack. Chunks of earth flew at the knights. They fight to the death. Everything should work out. One of the members of the alliance was standing in front of his mages and soldiers. He was confident that the slaves lost in battle could be replenished at any time. The main thing is to win. The army of the Arnesia Empire stood still. The green-haired man looked at them in surprise. He didn't understand why the Empire's troops didn't retreat, because if you think about it, in such a situation, only retreating would help save the troops. Suddenly, an arrow poked into the ground near the man's foot. Just a huge arrow. How did she get here? The leader from the Union had never seen anything like it. Many arrows were flying at the army. How is this even possible? The man asked himself. The warriors were pierced by arrows. The green-haired man stood fearfully in the middle of the battle. He covered his mouth with his hand and was sure that the arrows should end soon. You just need to endure this moment. A man with long hair was shooting knights in the back. The cavalryman charged the Union army. She was scared and ran away. Errol sat on the bird and didn't even want to think about what words his enemies were covering him with right now. There were arrows in front and cavalry in the back. The prince flew on his bird and watched as arrows pierced the shields below him. Arrows perfectly cope with their task. A rainstorm of them does not allow the enemy to take a step. Simple shields won't help here. The stump is clear, something more serious is needed, and the enemy has nothing. Errol put his hand to his ear, and at the fortress the men brought more arrows. The prince asked how many arrows were left. He was told that so far it is decent, just as they are being recharged. No matter how cool the crossbow is, it also has its drawbacks. Aiken was standing in front of the guys in the light uniform. Because of the poor design, you have to spend a lot of time recharging. If that was the only problem, but unfortunately not. Errol sat on top of his pet and closed his eyes. The catch is also in the arrow. Each arrow was made to order in the blacksmith shop. 
In other words, they are godlessly losing their funds right now. Suddenly, Daya put her hand to her ear. She asked the prince if he could hear her. Errol asked the girl what had happened. Perhaps the stones are running out. She was telling Errol that the enemy's mana was gone and there were still plenty of gems. The enemy mages were sitting on the ground. You could see the confidence in Errol and Daya's eyes. The hero asked how many more stones they had. The girl replied that another 80%, but 20% would have to be left to our defense. She can easily handle the block herself. Errol was flying over the battlefield. He insisted that no one spends the power of a level 6 mage on just one block. Errol cupped his ear and said that the cavalrymen were making way. Now it's their turn. Mages must burn the enemy. Daya took her staff and replied that everything would be done. The knights were standing in a sort of blue cage. They didn't understand what was going on. The stone on the staff shone, and a pillar of fire appeared on the battlefield. The two main tasks of magicians are minimum losses, maximum damage. The knights fled in fear. Who would have thought that the mana net protection spell could be used like this? Red hot chunks of earth lay on the ground. The knights looked on with sweat on their faces. Errol flew over the retreating army and shouted that they were doing the right thing. Errol opened his mouth wide and told his older brother and the others to pass it on. They go on the offensive against the Union army. Brother Arella stared menacingly into the distance. After the army of the Arnesia Empire started reporting victories, it became clear that the fighting was taking an unexpected turn. Of course, there were also those who did not like such news. The ruler of the Merman Empire sat with his face covered. He asked angrily what it all meant. Emperor Merman was talking to the ruler of the Demanuel Kingdom and the Archduke of the Sejapan Principality. Merman reported that just as the Archduke had said, he had ordered a general mobilization, sending out a huge number of soldiers, but in the end, things didn't go according to plan. The Archduke shamefacedly said that he was afraid that there was no excuse for him. The ruler of the Kingdom of Demanuel said that it was pointless to blame him now, because now you need to think about what to do next. He then asked the Archduke about what he thought lay ahead for them. The Archduke asked if they needed an honest answer. Then he said with regret that the situation was close to defeat because the bulwark of the fighting forces was lost, and the spirit of the remaining ones was greatly undermined. According to him, even if they happen to use soldiers correctly, they won't be able to hide from the innovative weapons of the Arnesia Empire. Emperor Merman asked if the Archduke was referring to the small arms that Errol had invented. The ruler of the Kingdom of Demanuel said that one master even called its creator a real monster. He was horrified to find out how it worked, because they hadn't been able to create anything like it. Emperor Merman thought irritably that he hadn't expected Errol to be so intrusive. The Archduke said that if they wanted to change the situation, they would have to buy some time to find the enemy's weak spot. Suddenly, a subordinate rushed into the room and started shouting that there was trouble. Emperor Merman exclaimed in exasperation that he had told them not to enter. The subordinate shouted in horror and trembling that the Arnesia army was advancing. Then we see Kania, who asked Errol if she should just break through the gate. Errol nodded happily at her and asked her to hit him hard. Kania was standing at the Demanuel Kingdom's border fortress. Kania swung for a kick, then leapt at the gate. She struck and sliced them open. The soldier shouted for the other soldiers to stop the enemies from getting in. The enemy attacked Kania. However, she wasn't the least bit afraid. She only asked them why they were running like turtles. Kania swung her sword and fought off the enemies. The soldiers scattered. Kania said that with such a small thing, she can handle it alone. Errol happily exclaimed that in this case, after all, there is nothing better than a master's sword. The heroes then invaded the border fortress of the Merman Empire. They also invaded the border fortress of the Sejapan Principality. The Emperor of Arnesia exclaimed that because of the enemy's greed, they had lost some of their men, and therefore it was time to avenge the pain they had suffered. Errol said that his father seemed really angry. Therefore, the next target is the capital of the Union of Three States. As a result, Errol's army managed to retake the borders and capture the enemy's fortresses. The girl looked up and said that she didn't even think they would get all the way here. Asya replied that she didn't expect this either because until recently their warriors were only retreating. Errol was pretty sure those three worms were tearing their hair out right now. Asya asked how Lady Kania was doing. Suddenly, we are transported somewhere and see a soldier falling to his knees and praising Princess Kania, calling her great. The soldier enthusiastically said that not only did she become a swordmaster at such a young age, but she also performed brilliantly in real combat. He begged her to reveal her secret. Kania shyly said that she just ate a lot and worked out a lot. The soldiers were delighted with her. Errol said that Kania was reaping her laurels, so he didn't push her. Moreover, she seems to like it. Asiya asked them what their next plan was. She asked if they would continue to storm the enemy. Errol confirmed this, but said they would slow down. Errol, like a maniac, said that they would put pressure on the Union gradually, taking away a grain from them, because bullying the enemy is in his line. Errol also said that in at least three years, 
They would be able to capture about 20% of the enemy's territory, and in about five years, the enemy would no longer be able to stand it. Usya asked if Errol meant that the enemy would break down in five years. Errol confirmed this, but clarified that most of them will starve to death. According to Errol, after three years, the Union will suffer huge financial losses, and they will gain full power over trade. The economic crisis is much worse than military pressure. Over time, civil war may break out in the Union. Errol also said that the enemy is waiting for him outside in the form of them, and inside, their own disgruntled people. Asya said it was terrible. Errol agreed with her and said that he didn't want to let that happen. However, he asked her not to forget that the enemy was going to treat them equally dishonorably. Errol said that if they dared to touch Arnesia, they should have considered the opposite situation and not started a war unless they were prepared for the consequences. Errol said that there was no need to feel sorry for the enemy because they had started this mess themselves and therefore they would have to deal with it themselves. Errol quoted that his father wrote in a letter that if the Union did not lower its weapons, it would face a retribution it would never forget. Errol said his father was scary when he was angry. The girl in armor said that after all, war is a terrible thing. Asya agreed with her. But Errol looked happy. He asked them not to worry, because his hypothesis is only real if the Union continues to resist. Then, looking more serious, he said that he was sure they would want to avoid such a scenario if they had brains. In the meantime, Errol can only wait for news. Meanwhile, Emperor Merman was slapping the armrest angrily and shouting that there was no way he would declare surrender. Merman said irritably that the Empire had never faced such disgrace in its entire history. A subordinate told him that their situation was already worse than ever. According to him, the best solution would be to withdraw the soldiers. However, Emperor Merman immediately objected. He once again slapped the throne and asked if it was a shame for a subordinate to say such a thing. The subordinate regretfully asked the emperor to believe that they would be much more ashamed if they continued the war. The subordinate also asked them how they could face innocent people who were dying of hunger and dying at the hands of the enemy. He said they had already lost. Therefore, the subordinate asked to stop further hostilities in order to save his subjects from suffering. Emperor Merman was confused. However, he did not change his answer and said that there would be no surrender. The subordinate was shocked and asked about why the emperor decided to do this. Emperor Merman replied that he understood the feelings of a subordinate who opposed the emperor's position by thinking of the people, according to him. However, capitulation is impossible. Emperor Merman asked if they thought that would make the situation better. He immediately said angrily that after that, they would stop considering them as human beings. After all, it wasn't anyone else who declared war, but Emperor Merman, if the result is the same in the end, there is no other choice. The subordinate continued to beg the emperor to think of his subjects. However, Emperor Merman, although fearful, said that the union of three states would not give up until the last moment. In the end, the alliance decided not to capitulate, but to fight Arnesia to the very end, to the best of their ability. Errol was shocked. He didn't expect that there were such short-sighted people in the government. Errol, watching from the fortress, said that if they surrendered, he would settle the issue of starvation for the civilian population. Errol wondered how they were going to win when even the general mobilization didn't help them. The hero sighed in frustration and said that there was no point in standing and watching all this. The last operation of the Union of Three States turned out to be a failure. The endless defeats and powerful weapons wielded by the Arnesia Kingdom had completely cut off the enemy's morale. A subordinate brought Emperor Merman a letter from Ernesia. In this letter, it was written that it was pointless to continue shedding blood, so they call on Emperor Merman to immediately surrender. The letter also said that if they decided to surrender, Ernesia would kindly provide them with assistance in the process of ending the war. The Emperor was confused. A few days have passed. The Emperor of Ernesia was reading the reply to the letter. After reading the letter, the Emperor of Ernesia said that this was a wise decision. In the end, the Union did capitulate. Errol was jumping up and down happily, shouting something. He fell to his knees and cried out in tears that the war was over and that he could go home. He suddenly remembered being discharged from the army in his first life. Errol went up to the tower of the fortress. With tears in his eyes, he shouted with all his might and cursed the Union, and also shouted that he didn't want to see them in their army. A small part of the troops of other feudal lords remained on the front line. But the troops, which included Errol and Kania, received the order to withdraw and return safely to the castle. Errol spread his hands to the side and said with a laugh that even in this blizzard, he was incredibly happy. He added that we still need to order the guys to clear the snow. Errol happily exclaimed that it was time to return to his carefree, idle life. The Arnesian emperor at the meeting said that the issue of post-war proceedings with the Union can be considered closed. According to him, it remains only to reward the heroes who bravely defended the borders of Arnesia. The emperor explained about the rewards and finally started talking about Errol. Everyone suddenly stiffened. They began to talk about how the third prince had done a good job and that it was worth rewarding him for his exploits. Suddenly, someone asked if the emperor was planning to leave those weapons in the third prince's fief. 
This green-haired man said that he believed that a mere fief wouldn't be able to handle such a weapon. Everyone else agreed with him. The emperor was displeased and irritably wondered who they thought Errol was. The emperor said that those weapons were imperial property, and that Errol himself had said that he wasn't going to leave them just in Fahilia. The emperor said that he was considering giving Errol the title of duke. Members of the assembly hesitantly replied that such an award was appropriate. The emperor said that he had asked Errol what he wanted, but the answer surprised him. The emperor said that Errol asked to give him the unremarkable fiefs that are located near Fahilia. Then we are transported and see a joyful Errol. He exclaimed that he knew the emperor would give him these territories. Errol said he could imagine them all sitting there laughing at him. Errol then told Dee that it was a little dry and asked her to adjust the temperature. The hero got up from the couch and said that now it's time to deal with what they got. Errol was once again convinced that he had a lot of money. He thought that it would be possible to cover the military expenses with this money and pay compensation to the soldiers. Errol knew that there were still prisoners, and therefore some of them would most likely be handed over to them. The Union was unable to redeem all the prisoners of war, and they officially became subordinates of Ernesia. And while everyone is still trying to figure out what to do with this bunch of subordinates, Errol has already decided. In Fahilia, there are many empty plots suitable for housing, and there is enough money for food. Therefore, it was decided to transfer half of the new subordinates to Fahilia. Errol relaxed and sat down on the couch, saying that the battle was exhausting, but not without some nice bonuses. Errol laughed and said that he could almost see the pieces starting to fit together. Meanwhile, the ruler of the kingdom of Demaniel pounded on the throne with his fist and cursed the rulers of Ernesia. He wondered in horror if they were asking for a compensation of two million gold pieces. He knew that such a sum could not be collected in a short period of time. To pay off the debt, they will have to suffer from poverty for several years and then recover for the same amount. He understood that they had to give up to survive, but it still made him angry. The subordinates knelt before the king and said that it was their fault and that their carelessness had led to the collapse. The king ordered them to raise their heads and use them to make estimates. However, the subordinates still felt guilty. The king said that they would deal with the punishment later, otherwise the situation in the state would become even worse. The king said that there would be no salary until all the nobles who participated in the war paid compensation. The subordinates bowed to him. The king said that the first step was to decide what to do next. Then we see what is happening in the Sejapan principality in the meantime. The archduke read the letter anxiously. He said that the emperor seems to have sent them to hell, because he says that he can't do anything to help and tells them to deal with the consequences themselves. The Archduke's subordinate was shocked. However, the Archduke said that on the other hand, he did not expect anything else because they are, after all, only a dependent state. According to him, they should be glad that everything ended at least like this. The Archduke held his head and said that the main problem right now was compensation. 800,000 gold and 40,000 more for the subordinates. The Archduke's advisor couldn't believe that the well-respected Archduke had become a major debtor in an instant. Then were transported to the Merman Empire. The people of the empire were very displeased and gathered outside the palace with pitchforks. They asked in displeasure if the emperor had sacrificed them first, telling them about justice, and now called it all a misunderstanding and rushed to retreat. The people called the emperor a murderer and shouted that he was to blame for the war. The emperor's subordinate said to chase away these vandals. However, Emperor Merman replied that such a scenario was expected from the moment the letter of surrender was sent. Emperor Merman said with regret that all this was his responsibility and his alone. After some time, the ruler of the Merman Empire left his post for health reasons, as a result of which the title passed to his eldest son. All three states of the Union will need a long time to get back on their feet. Then we see a princess who has been informed that it is time to leave. Kania wondered if it was possible to live a happy life if it was painted for you. At the same time, she was thinking that the palace was too boring. When Kania was little, she often played pranks and made her babysitters nervous. Kania really disliked studying. However, she was told that she should know everything that a princess needs. However, it's not that Kania doesn't like learning, she's just infuriated by all this royal stuff. Kania reflected that no one was arguing that she was the princess of Ernesia, but what did it have to do with living on a schedule? Kania trained hard in her swordsmanship. Her nanas said that fencing lessons seemed to be the only thing Kania tried to do. Holding the wooden sword in her hands, Kania thought about how cool it would be if her life was as free as swinging this sword. She knew that it might sound arrogant coming from the princess, but from that moment on, a deep desire was born in her. Kania was alarmed after reading a letter. Errol asked her in a daze if she had received a letter ordering her to return to the palace. Kania confirmed this. She said her parents had written to her. Errol replied that it seemed to have become very prominent during the war. Every noble in the kingdom now knows that Sister Arella has become a swordmaster. But, apparently, because fencing went against the image of the princess, the rumors were considered exaggerated. 
However, now that the war was over, everyone realized that this was not the case. Powerful cowards began to fear Sister Errol, saying that such a strong warrior should not sit in the wilderness. Errol had told Kanye that there were no people who didn't respect a swordmaster. He added that as far as Kanye knew, all current swordmasters were members of the ruler's personal guard. Kanya asked if Errol really wanted her to leave, too. Errol told her to come clean. The hero said that she followed him because she did not want to submit to the future plan for her. But she must know that this can't go on forever. Kanya was excited. Errol said that before, he could teach her something, so she became stronger. However, according to him, if she continues to stay with him, it will only freeze in place. In other words, it won't make any progress. Errol asked her why she didn't go back and take matters into her own hands. He asked her to set a goal for herself to get a vocation in some way. Errol added that as a result, she will gain independence and become a truly adult. Kania remained silent with a serious face. Then she said that Errol was right, but it didn't sound very convincing coming from someone who was always looking for an excuse to loaf around. This shocked Errol. He started to protest that it was different. The hero told her to prove that she has every right to become an independent knight. He asked her to think about it, and so Kania went to her room. The maids were holding up a picture of a man and talking about how lucky Kania was. They were happy that Kania would marry such a man. However, Kania was clearly not happy. When she picked up the photo, she just wondered if the stuffed animal would get in the way. Kania tore this photo to pieces. She wondered indignantly if, as an adult princess, a marriage of convenience was the order of the day. Tajia headed for the exit, but at the same time, she was thinking that it was useless to complain. Walking down the corridor, Kania thought that she had heard that Errol was being banished to another fief, and therefore, it was much harder for him now. She went to his room with the thought of supporting him. Then she heard him shout. Even though the sound was muffled, Kania clearly recognized that it was a cry of joy. She was shocked when she realized that unlike her, he had accepted his fate. Kania remembered what Errol had said when he grew up, he wouldn't work. Once upon a time, he said that he wanted to live like a gentleman in some remote corner. Kania was stunned because she realized that he wasn't joking at the time. She wondered if being exiled to another fief was really a lucky ticket for him. Kania thought that he was not just accepting the fate that was given to him, but as if he was adjusting it to himself. Kania thought about what she might be able to do. The princess wondered if she could do the same if she followed Errol and learned from him. Some time passed and night came, Kania went to bed. Lying on the bed, she reflected that at some point she had forgotten why she had come here. She decided she couldn't go on like this. She doesn't want to be a lousy older sister who does nothing but hope for a younger brother. And then morning came. Errol was sitting in his office, talking about how amazing the weather really was. Suddenly, someone kicked down the door and shouted the hero's name. It turned out to be Kania, who happily exclaimed that she had decided to return to the palace. Arella was very offended by the door. Just like that, Kania went back to the royal palace to find her vocation. Errol, of course, had thought of a backup plan B that would have resulted in the same outcome as if Kania had chosen to stay with him, but it didn't matter now. Kania remembered that there were two other sword masters besides her, and then she wondered if she should take them down first. Errol was stunned. He asked her to try not to wreck any more during training, as he would no longer be able to cover her expenses. Kania said she would keep that in mind. Watching her go, Errol hoped that she would find her way. He was sorry to leave her, but Errol knew she wasn't going to faraway lands. Errol made a mental promise to support her from the sidelines. After a while, Errol sat down in his office chair. Picking up some papers on the table, he said that it was time to go about his own business now. Errol was glad that Fahilia was still quiet today. He was also pleased with the news that young people from the village had a wedding. Suddenly, with a serious face, Errol began to reflect that the money had increased and the territories had expanded. He thought it was time to get into business thoroughly. With a sly smile, Errol thought that he still didn't care about power in politics, because it was true that those who had money ruled the world. Errol was happy to think that it was the most important weapon of a civilized society. Therefore, Errol needs to think about further plans in order to expand his influence. He confidently said that he would open a bank and carry out currency reform. According to him, currently most of the states use gold, silver and copper. And everyone, of course, has a different course. In such an unstable situation, currency reform would be of great use, and Errol knew it. He was thinking that if it wasn't for him, someone would definitely take it up, so he wouldn't delay this moment. Errol knew that if they took over the financial market and increased the value of their money, no more cockroaches would dare declare war on them. True, Errol will have to find a labor force, because you need a really good specialist. Errol's goal is to throw everything on the sidekick, and to hang around the pairs himself, as always. Errol exclaimed that this was the perfect plan. He wondered who to assign the task to. Suddenly, his mother got in touch with him. She asked him how he was doing. Errol said it was fine, he asked her what the sudden call was about. She replied that it was nothing special, 
just that Errol was already 16 years old. The hero was shocked. He didn't want that. His mother told him that it was time to find their fiancé a bride. Errol was horrified. Asya congratulated Errol. Daya was also happy for him. The short-haired girl in armor also joined them. However, Errol wasn't amused at all. It turned out that it was all because his mother had invited him to come home for the viewing, and the emperor and she had already made a list of candidates. Errol clutched his head and thought with horror that he hadn't had enough exercise yet. He strongly denied marriage. Errol was already beginning to miss his sister. Asiya asked who the potential brides were. The hero replied that it was still unclear about this, but, apparently, they decided to take his opinion into account at least a little, giving him to choose one of the ten applicants. That's why Errol called them. He asked if they would help with the selection. Errol reflected that the fact that they had to choose from the documents would make it difficult to understand their true intentions. The hero decided that in such a situation it is worth listening to the opinion of others. However, the girl in armor said that she didn't know much about such matters. Daya said she didn't know either. Asya also joined them. Errol was surprised to say that Asya was an aristocrat. Asya replied that their family had fallen apart even before they started talking about marriage. Errol asked Sena. She replied that they just grabbed someone they liked and dragged them home. Then he asked Dia. Daya replied that she has no experience but she believes that it is necessary to choose an educated girl from a good family who knows martial arts. Errol exclaimed that with her criteria, he would die alone. Errol approached them and told them that there were no other options, so they would work collectively. Sena glanced at one of the girls and asked Errol about her. The hero replied that he thought it was muddy, so he rejected it. Then he was asked about another girl. Errol rejected her as well, saying that the age difference between them was too great. It was night. We fast forward to the next morning. Morella's mother exclaimed with joy, because she saw who their son liked. After all the difficulties, they still chose Arella as the bride. Errol thought nervously that his mother really seemed to be hoping for something. Errol just picked out a girl from a quiet family who wouldn't cause too many problems. His mother had told him that the emperor was very happy about Errol's serious attitude towards marriage. Errol knew better than to tell the emperor that he didn't want to marry. So Errol came to the door of the room. There, he was greeted by Count Tuan Covenst. Saria Covenst was standing next to the Earl. She said she was the second daughter of the Covenst family, County of Covenst, a family of aristocrats living in the southwest of the empire. They are not rich, but they are famous for their deep traditions and have a fairly good reputation. Errol said he was glad to meet her. After that, Mother Arella and Count Tevno left the room. Saria seemed very soft and gentle to Errol, a prime example of a typical socialite. He asked her what she was doing. Saria said she loved literature. Errol thought that this wasn't his type after all. Errol was thinking that the girl must be very erudite, just an angel, not a bride. But Errol knew they were too different. She's like a white dandelion. Errol was thinking that she wouldn't be able to get along with a devil like him 100%. After a while, they ended the meeting. Saria said it was fun. Errol sat across from his mother. He was thinking about what to do now, since Saria seemed to like his mother a lot. Errol knew that his father must have liked her, too, so if he refused, it would put his mother in an awkward position. Meanwhile, his mother was quietly drinking tea, when suddenly she asked if Errol didn't like that girl. This shocked the hero. He asked if it was really that obvious. He immediately started trying to justify himself. However, his mother had told him not to worry, because Errol's opinion was important to them. According to her, the emperor himself said that their pressure will only make things worse. Errol thought that his father might have given up on his sister. Obviously, he knew that a forced marriage would lead to nothing good. Errol scratched his head thoughtfully. He apologized and said that this was not his option. As he left, he was relieved that he had barely managed to get out of it. Errol only thought that he would like to put the marriage question on hold for the time being and enjoy his bachelor life in peace. He reflected that so much had not yet been done, and that even the stake had not yet been invented. Errol exclaimed that the production of Coca-Cola is much more important than any marriage. Suddenly he saw something in the bushes. It was as if someone's eyes could be seen from there. He wondered what it was. He wondered if there were any rabbits in this garden. Suddenly, a creature leaped out of the bushes. Errol was stunned. He picked up the creature and realized it was a salamander. He asked what the fire spirit was doing here. Suddenly, he realized that if it was a spirit, then there must be a summoner. But as far as Errol knows, there aren't many people in their kingdom who are good at summoning. A girl came out of the bushes and asked if Errol would give her the lizard. The hero was surprised because he saw the princess of the Melman Empire, whose name is Fina Amurit Janel, who ended up here as an exchange student, but essentially a political hostage. Errol hadn't expected to see her here. He'd only heard about it from reports. The hero thought that she probably didn't know him. He asked her if this was her princess. The girl said that he could call her princess or Lady Feng. Errol replied that this was a rather brusque response for a princess. She took the salamander in her hands and said that it was not at home. 
Besides, she's here for school. She said she didn't really care about the formalities. Fina thanked the hero for catching her friend. Then she said goodbye to him. Errol only thought about what he hadn't even had time to ask. However, he asked her if it was a spirit by accident. Fina was nervous and exclaimed that she had no idea what it was about. According to her, it's just a pet. She was so excited that Errol immediately saw through her. He said she didn't know how to lie. She held her hands up in an attempt to convince Errol that it was an ordinary lizard. But at that moment the salamander began to breathe fire. Errol exclaimed in surprise and said that it turns out that lizards can even breathe fire now. However, Fina immediately grabbed Errol's face. She knocked him down and said she had no idea who he was. But she had ordered him to forget everything he had ever seen, and she would not be left in debt. Errol wondered what was wrong with her. For the first time, Errol sees such a fearless person who tries to bribe him. Errol agreed and said he would keep quiet. He asked her if she didn't want to make a fuss. Fina only asked him if it was true that Errol wouldn't tell anyone. The hero said that there was no benefit to him from this. According to him, even if he blabbed, it is enough for her to simply deny everything. Errol suddenly got angry and asked her indignantly why she had summoned a spirit at all if she didn't want to get caught. However, Fina said that it doesn't work that way. She can't control him. Errol realized that the connection between the summoner and the spirit could be considered a mutual agreement rather than a one-sided submission. The hero realized that the princess had not yet become a real summoner. Apparently, the salamander runs after her out of personal favor. Errol said that he would give her some advice especially for her. The hero advised that she should try to show the spirit who is in charge here. He told her to pretend that she was training a dog. Fina only thought that it wasn't a dog. Fina told the salamander to give her a leg. She was shocked, but the spirit listened to her. She was thrilled. Then she ordered the spirit to do a somersault. She also ordered him to get up and jump. Fina was very happy, she ordered the spirit to shrink and come to her. Errol said it was really simple. Fina happily said that he helped her out a lot. She wondered how Errol knew all this. The hero said that he just read about it in a book. Fina thanked him. Suddenly she approached him and asked him his name. Deadpan, Errol said she could have asked even later. The hero stood up and dusted himself off. Errol gave her his real name and said she'd better remember it. Errol had considered asking the fool for a name, but he wasn't joking now. He wondered how she would react. After all, this was the man who had made her a hostage. Suddenly, Fina exclaimed that Errol was from the royal family. Errol was taken aback, because this wasn't the reaction he'd expected. The hero asked her if she didn't have any more thoughts. Fina thought about it and said that it had an unusual name. Errol was shocked that she didn't really know about him. He wondered if she just didn't care about politics or something. Fen, meanwhile, wondered how much Errol knew about perfume. The hero replied that not so much, but he knows something. Then the girl asked if she could contact him with questions in case of anything. Errol agreed, but warned him that he didn't live in the palace. Fina was shocked and asked if Errol had been exiled. This made Errol incredibly angry, since she herself is from the ruling family and knows how everything works here. As he left, Errol said that if she wanted to meet up like this, she could ask one of the concubines for the address and then they could get in touch. Fina waved at him and said goodbye. Errol thought that even though he said so, they probably wouldn't cross paths again. Errol wanted her to forget him. That's what Errol thought then. A decent amount of time has passed since the end of the war, but the traces of it have not yet been completely erased. The smell of the dead is still strong. Some magician who walked in the middle of the battlefield said that this fragrance is very sweet. Suddenly, he began to levitate. He used fusion magic. This mage began to gather a clot of mana above him. The name of this fragrance is malice. Feelings of injustice, regret, fear, and confusion. Negative emotions that a person experiences when they die. This magician exclaimed that he could not have imagined that such a tragedy would happen, and therefore he was very lucky. He also exclaimed that it is worth saying thank you to the worm that provoked the war. According to him, there is very little left. The evil magician said that just a little more, and the very day will come. Then we flash forward and see Errol. He was thinking that since his engagement was postponed, he could start the bank with peace of mind. Errol, Asiya, and Daya arrived somewhere by teleportation. The hero said they were there. The heroes came to a gate. A blonde man met them there. This man's name is Hazel Kert, and he is the head of the Kert family. The man introduced himself and said that he was happy to welcome Mr. Errol. Hazel approached Asa and said that he understood that she was a lady of Pernal. Hazel took her hand and told her that his youngest daughter had told him about her. Asya was stunned and greeted him with a tremor in her voice. Errol looked at them happily and thought that they had arrived at Kert Manor on a very important matter. A girl named Haya who follows her brother Asi, the youngest daughter of Marquis Hazel Kert. He thought about the two of them standing up to each other. Kezel asked them to follow him into the manor. And so, after a while, they found themselves in the manor. Errol said he wouldn't beat around the bush and would tell them right away. The hero said that he wants to start a business with Hazel. The man replied that if Errol meant trading, 
Then as far as he knew, Errol already had a company. Errol said that the scale of this business is much larger. He slapped the table and exclaimed that he wanted to open a bank in Ernesia, which would be under his protection. Errol said that if you go into details, he wants to launch a new currency. According to Errol, the emperor already knows everything. Errol put the coins on the table and said that they were the ones that would go into circulation. The hero said that as Kessel knows, the current monetary system has too many flaws. Their coins are cast by dwarves, so they have an original composition that no one can fake. Errol happily said that he was even reproached for wasting his talent on some coins. Kessel was surprised to say that he understood, but he asked why Errol wanted to do business with him. Errol said he couldn't make the bank on his own, so he decided to find a decent partner. Errol approached him and told him that he wanted Hazel to become the bank's manager. Kessel asked the hero about the position of manager. The hero replied that in truth, his shoulders could not bear so many worries. That's why he needs someone like Hazel. Errol thought, with a sly, sneaky smile, that he could handle it, but that it was too much for him to follow the flow of money from all over the continent. Errol said that he guarantees, Kessel will get a huge profit from this business. Kessel, meanwhile, considered the suggestion carefully. He was sitting in a chair with his hand to his chin. Errol smiled sweetly at him, but at the same time was glad that the Marquis was still thinking. In other words, the Marquis isn't a money freak. He has a strong character and outstanding insight. Many people say that he is well versed in attachments. The Marquis told Errol that something was bothering him. The man asked how Errol could be sure that everything would go according to plan. The hero asked the Marquis not to worry, promising that he would contribute to this. Errol asked if the Marquis was afraid that the new currency might not take root in the kingdom. Market confirmed this. Errol got up from his seat and said that it was not without difficulties, of course, but the plan was quite feasible. Errol approached the Marquis and asked him in his ear who he thought had the most gold in the empire right now. The hero spread his hands and happily said that he had already discussed everything with the major trading companies. Errol exclaimed that his plans are not just to create a new currency, but also to strengthen the economic situation. The hero held out his hand and asked if the Marquis was in business. The Marquis replied that he was confident that Arella's plan was doomed to success. However, he added that Errol had already managed to earn a truly enormous fortune. The Marquis asked what motivated Errol to go into banking. The Marquis put his hand to his heart and said that if Errol was driven by pure passion, then, unfortunately, he would not be able to accept his offer. Errol replied that he understood him, but asked for an explanation in this case. Errol began to say that his own currency for him is just a way to control the cash flow, which will subsequently be used to build a metropolis in Fahilia. Errol told the Marquis that he was going to make a real paradise out of the land, which the aristocrats considered worthless. The Marquis was shocked when he heard about the metropolis. Errol continued to talk about this and said that the Marquis probably knows that building a city is not an easy task, even it is led by the state, so careful preparation is needed. According to him, in a sense, the bank can be considered one of the foundations for building a city. The Marquis did not look happy and asked if this was what Errol dreamed of. He also said that a simple feudal lord would laugh at the fact that Errol wanted to build a metropolis in Fahilia. However, Marquis likes that Errol is driven by such a big dream and not empty desires. Then they shook hands. Marquis said he accepted Arella's offer. The hero was glad and exclaimed that this was a wise decision. Errol was about to leave when suddenly the Marquis called out to him and asked how he and he would organize security. The Marquis asked if he should prepare the information. Errol replied that the Marquis should not do this because the hero plans to deal with this himself. The hero thought that first he needed to come to an agreement with someone. We are transported to the southern territories of the kingdom of Ernesia near the mountain borders. This land is home to Sena, a mercenary village called Nachifanel. They were there because Sena said her village was tight on mercenary work due to its location. Errol asked her if that was why they refused. Sena apologized because Errol had so much hope for her. However, Errol joyfully exclaimed that in this case he would have to go himself. That's how they ended up there. Errol walked happily and talked about how you shouldn't give up after the first refusal. Arella's main goal is to hire village mercenaries as bank guards. Since even Sena was unable to persuade them, there is only one option left, Errol must visit in person. Suddenly Daya stood in front of Errol and told him to hide behind her. Daya then took out her staff. She used magic and a blue aura appeared around them. With this magical wave, she hit two enemies who were sitting in the bushes. Sena was shocked when she saw them. Errol said that judging by the reaction, Sena knows who they are. Sena replied that these were people from her village. According to her, there seemed to be a misunderstanding. Sena decided that she should talk to them. Sena walked up and immediately hit one of them. She picked him up and started yelling at him furiously. Sena started kicking these men. Daya asked Errol what kind of language it was. The hero replied that local mercenaries migrated here from another continent, and therefore, apparently, this is their native language. 
The hero said that this language sounds too rude for simple conversation. Sena turned to the heroes and with a sweet smile said that now they can go. And so they came to the village of Nachafanal. The headman of this village is Avan Gowl. He apologized for the less than appropriate reception. Sena told her grandfather that he was shuffling around. Errol asked if they were related, judging by their last name. They confirmed it. Sena called him an old fart and he called her a fiend. Avan said that he was extremely uncomfortable in front of them because of his uncultured granddaughter. Errol found himself in an awkward position and exclaimed that everything was fine. Avan said he understands that they have come a long way to get here, but unfortunately they cannot take orders at the moment. According to him, if they came to put forward the same proposal, he could not help. He said that his answer would not change and therefore advised them to leave. Errol thought only that this old man was unshakable. Lee quietly told Errol that as she thought, this place had changed a lot. Errol asked if she really knew something. Daya said that when she escaped from the magic tower and got lost, she stopped in this village for a while. According to her, the villagers began to behave somehow strangely compared to what they had before, as if they were afraid of something. Errol asked Avan if they really had any problems. Errol expressed his desire to help if Avan told. Avan said with a sad look that they cannot involve them in this, especially since Avan is afraid that they will not be able to solve the problem of the village. However, Errol was persistent and asked Avan to talk about the problem. Avan was very nervous. He asked if Errol had heard of such creatures as the Walking Dead. The heroes were stunned. Avan said that they began to appear in the vicinity of the border recently. According to him, they have already counted about a thousand creatures. The hero was shocked. Avan asked if Errol really knew nothing. The hero thought that something was wrong here. He thought that the old man said that he saw a thousand walking dead, but it was very quiet around. This issue was not even raised at the royal meeting. Errol asked Avan who owned their land. The village chief said that the owner had recently changed. Now he is Count Catiller Rubit's cousin. Errol asked why he was hiding the fact of the appearance of the dead. Avan replied that this was because so far only their village had received damage. The hero was surprised. He said it's getting weirder and weirder. We then flash forward a couple of years into the past and see Count Kettle Rubit. The Count, sitting on an armchair, said that they would need to organize a reception soon, and the treasury would be in trouble, and therefore they would have to raise taxes again. The butler told the Count that the village had had a bad year, so the residents were having a hard time paying taxes. Count Kettle irritably asked if the butler was laughing, because this was tantamount to an insult to him. The Count angrily hit the table with his fist and asked if they really couldn't even pay their taxes. He exclaimed that in this case the butler should get rid of these useless rats. Errol, after listening to this story, asked if the Count had really gone crazy. Avan said that his son and Sena's father prevented that tragedy. Avan's son opposed the Count's plans and was able to save the village, which was condemned to liquidation thanks to a petition. However, the previous landowner blamed all the crimes on him as revenge. When Sena heard about this, she became noticeably gloomy. Avan also added that two years ago the villain finally paid for his sins when it turned out that he had illegally taken possession of the title. Errol asked if it was in this way that the place of feudal lord went to his cousin. Errol put his hand to his chin and thought that the current owner of the land seemed to be deliberately hiding the appearance of the dead on his territories. Errol began to talk about how he would solve their problem, but Avan immediately interrupted him and said that he shouldn't do that. Avan said that they planned to leave these areas. The hero was surprised and asked for more details. Avan explained that this is not a problem for their tribe, because they have been nomadic for centuries. According to him, a landowner who sits idly by is undoubtedly bad, but the main reason for their departure is still the walking dead. Avan said that they somehow fought back all this time, but this cannot continue. Errol asked if they wanted to move to another state. Avan nodded in response. Errol replied that he understood them perfectly, but now it is not so easy to get abroad. The hero said that even tribes leading a nomadic lifestyle cannot simply change their citizenship. Avan agreed with Errol and said that he was right, but they had little choice. Errol replied that their relocation could give rise to another conflict. Errol asked about what if they simply solved the problem with the dead. Avan was stunned and asked how they were going to do this. He couldn't understand, since he was over a thousand dead, especially why Errol should try for the sake of the village. Errol waved his hand and said that he knew what he was doing, and as he had already said, he was counting on their help in return. The hero told Avan to think about the greatest benefit for the tribe, because there is no guarantee that they will find permanent shelter and food in another country. Here Errol will help them eliminate the dead and will also pay good money for their labor. The hero asked if the choice was not obvious. Avan just remained silent. He then asked if he could think for a moment. This made Errol happy. After some time, Sena and Errol were sitting on a bench somewhere in the village. Errol said it was now clear to him why the people from her village ambushed them. Sena said that as far as she knows, a stranger recently showed up here and later became the walking dead. 
Meryl thought that the fighting skills of most of the locals were in no way inferior to the skills of real knights. However, the hero realized that judging by their moods, they had suffered a lot. Errol watched the duel between the young men. He saw a blue light on the sword of one of the young men and realized that this guy seemed to be one of those who easily awakened the aura. Errol reflected that leaving him and the others to their fate was a real waste. The hero thought about his cunning plan and how he would get the most out of them if they took his bait. At the same time, Sena looked at him enthusiastically and thought that he was kind. After much deliberation, the headman accepted the offer, but on the condition that if the problem with the dead was not solved, the tribe would leave the village. Errol was confident that he could and decided that if he couldn't help, then he was a loser, not a pro. Gradually they began to destroy the dead. Sena, placing her foot on the dead man, said that at the moment most of the dead were simply swept away in the forest and, apparently, they were attracted to wild animals. Errol replied that the village was lucky. They quietly watched the dead. Errol was surprised and could not understand where these creatures even came from. However, he suggested that judging by the pattern of their behavior, they were not under magical control, and besides, it was possible that some klutz had riveted the dead for fun and got away. Errol, putting his hand to his chin, wondered in whose empty head such a crazy idea could arise. Sena asked him if they would continue to catch the dead. Errol rejected this and said that it was too ineffective, and he had come up with a better way. Errol joyfully exclaimed that he was going to pull them all into one place and cremate them at once. Sena was shocked and asked him how this was possible, and Daya in turn was amazed by him. Errol understood that the most proven way to fight the dead was holy water, but this was not a cheap pleasure and for some reason it was incredibly difficult to get in their country. Errol exclaimed enthusiastically that they had a sixth grade magician and asked what else was needed. He asked a rhetorical question about how to collect the dead in one pile. And after some time, he and Sena had a picnic at night. Sena felt uneasy while Errol calmly drank his tea. Errol decided that the best solution was to prepare a tasty bait for the dead. Errol was completely calm and admired the shooting star. Sena was concerned and asked him if they were doing everything right. Errol replied that the dead are driven by basic needs, which means that people for them are number one in their diet. Daya was also calm and also drinking tea. Meanwhile, Errol continued to talk about how they had made a good bait. However, Sena doubted this and asked why Errol personally acted as bait, because it was dangerous. Errol sighed and said that his participation is now simply necessary. Errol said that her grandfather showed that he was still skeptical, and the aristocrat's personal involvement could make him change his mind. Suddenly Errol became interested in something. He caught Sena off guard by asking her what she would do if her people did leave the empire. Errol asked her if she would go with them, but Sena laughed nervously. Errol understood that Sena was the kind of person who would never turn her back on her homeland, and therefore, most likely, she would resign and return to the tribe. Errol told her that no matter what decision she made, he would not dissuade her, but this did not change the fact that he was sorry to part with such a talent as her. Sena was inspired and laughingly asked if it was true. Suddenly zombies started running towards them. Errol stood up and said that apparently the target was on its way. He extended his hand to her and asked if she was ready. Sena took his hand and exclaimed that she was always ready. Sena took Errol in her arms and began to run away from the dead with him. However, the monsters continued to pursue them. On the way, the dead tried to attack them, but Sena deftly dodged and ran on. At this time Errol was thinking that the dead were really dangerous. He turned around and looked at the dead, he felt like a horror movie hero, because zombies do not crawl like turtles, but run as fast as they can. Errol exclaimed joyfully that it was like they were playing tag. Sena reprimanded him, saying that now was not the time for jokes. Errol saw that some of the zombies had already come running. He immediately exclaimed that Daya was coming out now. She understood his order and immediately took the staff in her hands. Daya used a firewall spell and attacked the dead. The pillar of flame was very bright and high, so much so that the dead nearby noticed it. Errol and Sena covered their noses, because it began to smell horribly. Errol said that, apparently, the magician didn't even bother to protect the dead from mana because they were too easy to kill. Errol asked if they really were made as an experiment. It seemed to the hero that something was unclean here. Suddenly he saw another crowd of zombies, he exclaimed that there was no end to the dead. The dead saw the heroes and began to run after the heroes. Errol calmly exclaimed that now they need to repeat the same thing, according to his estimates, in which case they should finish it by morning. And then the morning came. Sena was exhausted and lay down on the ground to rest. Errol praised them and said that, apparently, even a knight would have a hard time carrying a person on him all day long. Errol turned around and his smile disappeared from his face. The hero saw the bones that remained from the dead and said that they seemed to have dealt with all the dead. Errol turned to Dia and asked if there was really no one else here except the dead. Daya shook her head and said that, unfortunately, she found no traces of human mana. Errol noticed military uniforms and armor instead of burial clothes. He decided that it would be necessary to better study the surroundings of the borders on which the war was fought. 
Then the hero joyfully exclaimed that since they had finished, it was time to return to the village. The heroes returned to the village, but the people who were next to them could not breathe because the heroes stank strongly. Avin said he thought they should wash themselves before negotiating. With Daya's help, she showed Avin the work they had done. Errol said that from what they could see, the matter of the dead had been largely resolved. Errol exclaimed joyfully that he had kept his promise, as he had said, so now he could talk about work with peace of mind. Avin was excited, he said that he did not expect them to finish so quickly. Errol replied that his family does not tolerate onlookers. He also told Avin that he would deal with everything that concerns their landowner himself, so Avin needn't worry. The headman of the village of Avin replied that he did not even know how to thank them. Errol enthusiastically replied that he did not need gratitude, but agreement to cooperate, because he wanted to hire capable people as security guards for his bank. Arella said such terms of employment would be reflected in a written contract. He also guaranteed that everyone would be satisfied, because Errol never deprives his people. Avin agreed to cooperate and thereby incredibly pleased Errol and Sena. The contract with the mercenary village has been concluded. Because of the bank, Errol even had to deal with the dead. One way or another, Errol was left with the last stage. And so we are transported to Arnesia's palace, where an official meeting is currently taking place. Errol stood up and told the assembly that his plan was to create a special imperial bank with a corresponding reputation. He also noted that the contract states that the bank is a special institution for storing and lending money. A man raised his hand and said that he didn't understand why a simple safe in his home wasn't enough to store money. Errol replied that it was possible, but asked if they had considered how safe it would be. The hero asked if they had ever thought that someone could get into this safe and steal the money. Errol smiled, but at the same time, like a villain, he thought that there had already been cases of penetration with magic and the brazen theft of all hidden funds. The hero told members of the meeting that he was striving to create the safest storage facility that no one could get into. He plans to provide the bank with reliable security, guaranteed by his name and the name of mercenaries, whose skills are not inferior to knightly ones. Errol told the man that, of course, custody is not the only function of the bank, because an equally important part is the system of lending money. The man asked if Errol was going to lend money to anyone for nothing. The hero denied this, because the bank will give money only to those who are able to return it. Moreover, according to Errol, the bank will regularly receive a certain share from the debtor based on the loan amount. The same man asked what would happen if a person suddenly refused to repay the debt. Errol, looking crazy, asked the man what he thought. The man was shocked. Errol said that be that as it may, this will help improve the economy of the empire because the most multifunctional bank in history will come to the rescue. Members of the meeting were skeptical of Errol's words that after the creation of the bank, he intended to put into circulation a new currency that would replace gold. Members of the congregation began to doubt and debate the idea even more. However, the hero expected that they would begin to object. Errol said that to the best of their knowledge, the current currency has an unstable value and shape due to counterfeiting of coins and mixing of their gold with the gold of other countries. The members of the congregation hung their heads in shame. Errol said he would like to make up for these omissions. The hero bowed a little and said that all the capital needed to distribute the new currency would be provided by Errol. He also guarantees the need for these changes in the name of the royal family. Errol finished explaining his plan and asked them to share their opinions. The members of the meeting began to look at each other and nod. They began to agree, which pleased Errol, but there were those who decided to abstain. Errol was very pleased that before the meeting began, he ingratiated himself with some of those present by bribing them. He happily thought that now everything was ready and now it was time to move on to construction. After the meeting ended, one of the counts asked Dezel if he really would just leave everything as it was. Dezel Pratz turned around and asked him what he was going to do about it. Dezel said that Errol is a duke and therefore he has every right to conduct such a business. However, this guy continued to object and began to talk about what would happen if Errol was not stopped. Dezel asked if Count Kane Rubit was going to have problems. Dezel went further and said that Kane should thank him for keeping Dezel silent about the fact that Kane was hiding a whole thousand stray corpses. He also said that he no longer has any desire to cover for Kane and his swindles. Kane wanted to object, but Dezel had already left. In the end, everyone agreed, thanks to which the bank was completely ready within a month. And this despite the fact that it is located on the best land in the capital. Errol looked at the bank and thought that in the future it would be necessary to establish a branch in a city with good trade or a high percentage of tourists. At the same time, he understood that a bank would not open in Fahilia anytime soon. Errol accidentally overheard a passerby who spoke enthusiastically about the fact that it now seemed possible to take out a loan at a good interest rate. This green-robed man was also pleased that now they would no longer have to suffer from the violence and cosmic sums demanded by the moneylenders. The man was very happy and exclaimed that he would finally be able to carry out his long-standing plan. To some luxurious house, aristocrats discussed the news that an imperial bank had opened in the capital. 
However, the fair-haired gentleman said that his safe was more reliable than any bank. The green-haired man asked if this aristocrat remembered the robbers who had recently encroached on their goods. The blonde man replied that he, of course, remembers them because they caused so many problems. The aristocrat began to talk about how the bank's carts drove. The criminals stood on the ledge and watched the carts. They said that carts with bank currency were their goal. The criminals attacked the carts with the idea that with this money they would be able to rest for several years. However, suddenly someone hit the criminal who ran into the cart. The blow was incredibly powerful and the criminal was thrown several meters away. The guards said that the robbers were very brave since they decided to attack their carts. They punished the robbers who dared to encroach on the bank's property. The blonde aristocrat was shocked when he heard the story that the bank guards control the aura and smash the robbers to smithereens. The green-haired aristocrat also said that it turned out that Count Rubit was behind the thieves. This count will receive a serious punishment since his list of crimes also includes hiding the dead. Both aristocrats were somewhat confused. The blonde aristocrat turned to the butler and asked if they still had the details of that same bank contract. This is how a new chapter began in Ernesia's financial flow. We are then transported to the palace and see the emperor of Ernesia. He asked Errol if there was any need for this. Errol beamed with joy and nodded his head. The emperor began to walk from side to side because he was tormented by doubts about whether it was worth rebuilding Fahilia. The hero said that he believes that Fahilia is a province that is worth developing and for this it is necessary to build as many infrastructure facilities as possible. The emperor was confused and said that he understood Arella's enthusiasm, but rebuilding an entire city was easier said than done. The emperor asked what Aralus planned to do next if he succeeded in doing so. At the same time, the emperor thought that Fahilia was a very harsh region due to its distance from the center and cold climate. Errol understood that the emperor was probably worried that even after the city was rebuilt, Fahilia would remain a shelter only for locals and that no one from outside would want to move there. This is a problem that could very well destroy the province. The emperor said that no matter how worthy a ruler Errol was, it was not easy to develop such a backwater from scratch. Errol, hearing this, thought with shame that everything was completely wrong. Suddenly the emperor approached Errol and quietly said in his ear that in fact he planned to help him get out of this province in a couple of years. The emperor planned to find favorable conditions for Arella, but, unfortunately for the emperor, problems arose with this. The hero was shocked, he thought that this was a very rash choice, because an attempt to push him through would have caused discontent among the aristocrats. Errol wondered if the emperor was really willing to do such a thing for him. The emperor walked away from Arella. The hero bowed and said that he was very grateful for his kindness, but did not intend to leave his lands. The emperor asked him a question about why he did not want this. Errol immediately began to think that there was no point in him going to a place full of annoying aristocrats when he finally saw the prospect of building his own paradise. In addition, Errol does not want to interfere in political games. Errol clenched his hand into a fist and said that if it were an ordinary province, no one would go into it, but Errol could make this city shine. He asked the emperor to trust him. It was clear from Errol that he was inspired and determined. The emperor sighed heavily and said that, looking at his decisive attitude, he could not refuse him. He also added that he appreciates Errol's determination and agrees. The hero was delighted and thanked his father. The rebuilding of Fahilia went smoothly. Residents were notified in advance and gave their consent. The best personnel for construction were also selected. Errol stood in his office and thought about what Aiken had told him that there were rumors among the masters that working under the direction of Errol automatons gave access to amazing technologies. The hero also thought that it would be great if various talented people personally came and helped him. Errol had a dialogue with someone and said that, first of all, he wanted to entrust them with a residential area in which the local population could feel calm and comfortable. He also said that besides this, they have a lot of work to do, because he, in fact, plans to plow everything here. Morella's interlocutor, namely an elderly gray-haired man, replied that in this case, a strong fence would first be needed. Errol agreed to this, since the area is full of ferocious monsters. But at the same time, he understood that the locals would not be particularly surprised by a three-meter rabbit running nearby or a lord on a griffin flying over their heads. However, given that in the future there will be visitors to Fahilia, such points should be taken into account. The hero waved his hand and said that safety comes first, and besides, Arella has the perfect stone for the fence. Errol showed them the stone and said that he thought the stone was strong enough. The man examined this stone and said that this specimen definitely has no equal, but it will take a lot of such stone to build a wall. Errol exclaimed that they don't have to worry about this, because the mines given to Errol as a reward for participating in the war are full of them. Errol said that he heard that other lords neglected this stone due to the lack of technology for its extraction, but this stone is quite tough for them. 
Errol happily thought that this amount would be enough to build an entire castle, and there would still be some left over. He also had the idea that he wanted his own statue. Suddenly the man raised his hand and asked Errol for what purpose he wanted to rebuild this city, because Errol had not previously been concerned about the safety of the population there. Errol confirmed this and happily told them that he wanted to make the city a tourist destination. Errol understood that the production of their special products is, of course, great, but Errol does not want to spend his whole life on it and die without accumulating a fortune. The hero leaned a little towards them and said that when the time comes, he will tell you more, but for now he suggested discussing the schedule. Some time passed, Errol was tired and yawning. He looked out the window and said that due to their scale, it takes a long time to check everything, but it is progressing. The hero took something out of his pocket and said that he would leave the rest of the work to the masters for now, and he would rest a little. Errol pressed the button and a portal opened. The hero entered the portal and looked out of it and left. The hero called this place his personal paradise where he can enjoy his vacation. Errol walked into this room and said that it was called Errol's Nook Number 3. The hero took a drink from the refrigerator and said that, of course, he could live in the castle, but he also has a thirst for personal space. According to him, it was fun to stir up a kind of secret base, adding all sorts of things here. In addition, it is strong enough to be used as cover in the event of a siege. Errol lay down on the bed and wondered if now he could do nothing for his own pleasure. Errol drank the drink and said with delight that next time he might build a base somewhere at the hot springs. Out of boredom, the hero began to leaf through the books. He thought that the downside of the Middle Ages was that there was too little entertainment. However, the choice of books is also small, since there are either books on magic or boring novels for nobles. He suddenly remembered comics and how much he missed them. Errol stood up sharply and wondered whether it was worth setting up printing production now that everything was in order with the supply of paper. Errol wanted to try himself in a new industry. He put his hand to his chin and thought that eating and sleeping alone was not enough for pleasure because he also needed to occupy his eyes with something pleasant. Errol sat down on the bed and said that he decided it was time to go and do it. Suddenly someone contacted Errol and told him that there was trouble. Someone told Errol that an urgent message had just arrived from the palace. Then we see some purple stone. Some magician laughs maliciously and says that this stone is made of the wonderful material of resentment. He exclaimed that he had finally managed to accumulate enough grievances. The magician raised his staff above himself and irritably wondered how they dare to look down on them and call them black magicians simply because of that their thirst for knowledge is somewhat different. Then the magician hit the ground with his staff. Hitting the ground, the magician exclaimed for the victims of the greed of the bad people in power to wake up. The ground began to shake. A dead man crawled out of it. The dead came out of the ground one by one and there were more and more of them. The magician began to laugh madly. He said that now even the dark sect would be forced to recognize him. He ordered the dead to go forward and show the king that they dared to neglect them, true strength. The dead listened to his orders. Then we are transported somewhere and see a watchman who stood on the tower and said that in recent days everything has been quite calm. However, when he looked through binoculars, he saw something that shocked him. The marines exclaimed that these were undead. He wondered why there were so many of them. He shouted to his comrades to urgently report this to the command. Then we see Errol, who was reading a letter about how a large number of undead appear on the northeastern and southern borders and their number is estimated at several hundred thousand. Errol realized that they were about to cross the borders of Ernesia and the three-state alliance. He became very angry and agitated about this. When Asiya found out about this, she was shocked. She asked if all the victims of this war had turned into evil spirits. Errol confirmed this and said that if we take into account the testimony of the soldiers in charge of intelligence, the number of dead soldiers corresponds to the number of undead, so it is true. Daya said that it seems that what happened in Sena's home village should be considered as training. Daya turned gloomy and said irritably that it seems that black magicians, who are terrible people with bad taste, are involved in this. Errol said that be that as it may, the undead have split up and have already crossed the borders of Ernesia and the three-state alliance. Sena asked if Errol thought it was time to sound the alarm and gather troops. However, the hero, putting his hand to his chin, replied that he was not sure, since there were no messages from the palace, probably they had not yet decided what to do there. Errol thought hard that he had relaxed too early, because he needed to study everything more carefully. The hero was worried because he did not find significant evidence in time, so he miscalculated. The hero suddenly fell to his knees and began to shout furiously that because of the undead, trade and the reconstruction of the city would also suffer. However, then he calmed down and asked the Sia and Sena to tell the guards to be vigilant, because the undead could enter the estate. Errol put his hand to his chin and asked them not to worry too much, because he had a couple of ideas. The hero thought that if problems arise, it is better to consider them opportunities. He wondered if he should take this opportunity and try to hit the jackpot. Meanwhile, terrible things were happening in the border fortress of Ernesia. Many dead people tried to climb the fortress. The border guard was shocked that the vile creatures were moving non-stop. 
The border guards were tense, they were talking about that thanks to the successfully organized defense there were no large losses. As ordered, they focused on fighting the undead attacking the walls. When the border guards first heard the warning about the undead heading to the capital, they thought it was some kind of joke, but thanks to this report they are still alive. Their commander shouted to his subordinates to continue their defense until further orders came from the castle. We are then transported to the castle of Emperor Anesia. The emperor shouted to his subordinates to give the order to organize the evacuation of residents living near the border. He also exclaimed that in the worst case, he would have to leave the fortress, but that did not matter. He calmed down and, putting his hand to his chin, thought that Errol had made a good decision by offering to prepare in advance because otherwise they would have lost a lot more people. The man who was sitting next to him turned to the emperor and said that endless defense would not solve the problem and that drastic measures must be taken. The emperor replied that, as this man himself knows, this is an unprecedented case in the history of the empire. The man asked how about asking the Holy Kingdom for help. The emperor was stunned. Holy Kingdom of Jellion. It is the most skilled country in the world in fighting the undead and other dark forces such as necromancy and curses. The emperor replied that their methods were certainly impressive, but the emperor highly doubted that they would simply help them. Following its doctrine, for many years the Holy Kingdom officially denied all types of creatures except humans. However, in the Arnesia Empire, representatives of a wide variety of races can obtain citizenship, subject to certain abilities. Because of these disagreements, relations between the countries are tense, although this is not yet reflected in politics. The king said that it was unknown what they would ask for the help they provided. They may try to make one or more changes to their policies, he said. The man in the green suit replied that they could certainly try to deport or discriminate against members of other intelligent races. The king said that this is why the Holy Kingdom should be the last thing to contact. At the same time, the king seriously thought that if there was no other choice, he would have to turn to the Holy Kingdom. A subordinate approached the emperor and, holding out the letter, nervously asked the emperor to urgently look at it. The emperor opened the letter and was stunned. Suddenly the emperor stood up abruptly. His subordinates were surprised and asked him what happened. The emperor said that perhaps they would not have to be in debt to the Holy Kingdom, because Errol reported that he had a solution. We are transported and see what is happening in the Merman Empire. Thick smoke is pouring out of the buildings. People are running down the street in panic, screaming that the undead are coming. The knights of the castle asked what they should do. People who ran up to the castle asked that the gates be opened for them. The scouts reported to the ruler that a horde of undead had crossed the border and attacked the village. The emperor was also told that the victims were knocking on the locked gates of the castle and asking for asylum. Island Amurit Janel, who is the current ruler of the Merman Empire, was very excited and thought that this was horror. Island thought that after the war the situation, although it improved a little, but the citizens' distrust of the empire remained unchanged and it was difficult to cope with it. The massive invasion of the undead only makes the situation worse. The emperor asked if they could count on the support of their allies. The subordinates said that it would not be easy, since the kingdom of Damaniel was also in a difficult situation. The green-haired man said that fortunately, the holy kingdom offered to save them. The man said that they would have to accept the holy kingdom's offer. Island desperately replied that there was no other option now, and therefore ordered to ask for help from the Holy Kingdom. The subordinates lowered their gaze in shame and listened to Aelin talk about how bowing down to the Empress of the Holy Kingdom was all they could do now. Aelin was also very tense and thought that, obviously, in the future they would interfere in the affairs of the Empire, but there was no time to think. The key reason why the Holy Kingdom is taking the initiative in this situation is because of the holy water they are distributing. Monsters run away only when they smell it, and the undead are cleansed with just one drop. Many countries studied holy water to find out the secret, but it was all in vain. The Holy Kingdom actively offers support to countries affected by the undead, using its holy water as an excuse, but in return they demand in full, forcing them to sign absurd treaties. This is their policy. We are transported somewhere again and see how the aristocrats are discussing the fact that the Merman Empire has entered into an agreement with the Holy Kingdom. They also talked about how, despite the ridiculous conditions of the Sacred Kingdom, the Ernesia Empire was also a problem. After the war, Ernesia's influence became so great that it was not easy to get along with the Sacred Kingdom, with which Ernesia had problems. The ruler of the empire, Damaniel, thought that it was strange that everyone was worried about the threat of the undead, but for some reason Ernesia did nothing. The emperor couldn't understand this because it looked like they didn't need help. However, breathing out a sigh of relief, he decided that this was hardly possible and he needed to come up with a way to deal with the undead. Meanwhile, the butler burst into the room, holding some paper in his hands. He gave the emperor a letter from the Arnesia Empire. When the emperor read the letter, he was shocked. The emperor wondered if they were saying that they were providing the means to destroy the undead at a lower price. We are transported to the events that took place a little earlier in Fahilia. The man with glasses was very excited. 
He asked, is Errol talking about creating holy water? Errol nodded in response. He asked the man with glasses if he had tried to secretly bring holy water. The hero said that it seems that this is not just water, but some strange concentrated mana. Errol said he did some analysis and it seems like he can replicate this lineup to a certain extent, if that's what he thinks. The man with glasses was stunned and exclaimed that then Errol would do something that no one had ever managed before. The hero smiled from ear to ear and took a bottle of holy water in his hand, saying that he needed to earn money somehow. That's how this video ends. If you have sat through to the end, please don't forget to press the subscribe button and leave feedback. See you in the next video.